Good afternoon. For the record, my name is Tania Fernandez Anderson, the District 7 City Councilor. I am the chair of the Boston City Council Committee on Ways and Means. This hearing is being recorded for, and it's, it's being recorded and it's being live streamed at boston.gov forward slash city dash council dash TV and broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82 and Files Channel 964. The council's budget review process will encompass a series of public hearings beginning in April and running through June. We strongly encourage residents to take a moment to engage in this process by giving public testimony for the record. You can do this in several ways. Attend one of our hearings and give public testimony. We will take public testimony at each departmental hearing and also at two hearings dedicated to public testimony. The full hearing schedule is on our website at boston.gov forward slash council dash budget. Our scheduled hearings dedicated to public testimony was April 26th at 6 p.m. and the following on June 2nd at 6 p.m. You can give testimony in person here in the chamber or virtually via Zoom. For in-person testimony, please come to the chamber and sign up on the sheet near the entrance. For virtual testimony, you can sign up using our online form on our council budget review website or by emailing the committee at ccc.wm at boston.gov. When you are called to testify, please state your name and affiliation and residents and limit your questions or comments to two minutes to ensure that all comments and concerns can be heard. Email your written testimony to the committee at ccc.wm at boston.gov. Submit a two minute video of your testimony through the form on our website. For more information on the city council budget process and how to testify, please visit the city council's budget website at boston.gov forward slash council dash budget. Today's hearing is on dockets 0480 to 0482, orders for the FY23 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations for the school department and for other post-employment benefits OPEB. Docket 0483, orders for capital fund transfer appropriations. Docket 0484 to 0486, orders for capital budget including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. Our focus area for this hearing will be Boston Public Health Commission BPHC Part 2, including emergency medical services, homeless services, recovery services. Our panelists for today's hearing are Dr. Pisola Ojikutu, Commissioner of Public Health, City of Boston and Executive Director of Boston Public Health Commission. Tim Harrington, Director of Administration and Finance. James Hooley, Chief of Emergency Medical Services. I am joined today by my colleagues, Councilor President Ed, Ed Flynn, District 2, Councilor Aaron Murphy at large, Councilor Michael Flaherty at large, Councilor Liz Braden, District 9. Before I turn over to the administration for their presentation, um, just so that I explain the format, you will have about uh, 10 to 15 minutes for your presentation. We'll do one round of questions. Each counselor will have eight minutes for their questions and answers and then we'll go to public testimony if there's anyone signed in. Um, we will uh, then go to second, a second round, um, depending on how much time we have, um, then a third round uh, for final comments and statements. Um, Chief Hooley, please uh, you feel free to take your own microphone to your right. Um, you know, just a reminder to panelists um, to please speak into the microphone so that um, we can actually hear you um, from f virtually from um, on YouTube or in either of the channels. Thank you. You can feel free to take um, additional seats. 
wherever there is space. Okay. Um, without uh, further ado, uh, you have the floor for your presentation. Uh, please state your name again and sure. position and role in uh, affiliation. For Chief, the record. Chief, I think I'm going to go first for the two slides. I think I have two slides. Okay. And I'll go straight to you. Okay. Is that okay? However you guys want to okay. do it. Okay. I'll go first. Okay. Good afternoon and thank you again, Chairperson Anderson and members of the council for the opportunity to testify today. For the record, my name is Dr. Basolo Chikutu and I am Commissioner of Public Health for the City of Boston and Executive Director of the Boston Public Health Commission. I'm joined by Tim Harrington, Director of Admin and Finance for the Commission and Chief James Hooley, Chief of Department for EMS as well as other members of EMS who will be introduced later. So this session will focus on the work of three BPHC bureaus that deeply impact the lives of those experiencing acute public health needs, the Homeless Services Bureau, Recovery Services Bureau, and Boston EMS. And hopefully you all have the slides in front of you to follow along. So I'm going to start with the Homeless Services Bureau. <clears throat> Our Homeless Services Bureau has been at the center of the Commission's response to the crisis related to COVID-19 and unsheltered homelessness. We run two emergency homeless shelters um, and they remain fully operational throughout the pandemic, um, sheltering on average 460 guests per night and providing 130,000 total shelter nights to over 3,500 unique individuals throughout the year. We provide a broad range of services to emergency shelter guests, including, of course, shelter, uh, food, health needs. Uh, in general, the shelter serves as a starting point for connections to housing as well as employment. Just this year, 110 clients were provided employment with our Serving Ourselves or SOS Workforce Training Placement Program. In response to the humanitarian crisis at Mass and Cass, Homeless Services established an emergency response team that did street outreach, including direct clinical and housing relocation supports, as well as transportation services to assist with ongoing engagement of unsheltered individuals and services and removal of the encampments. To respond to the needs of this population, uh, we opened Dorm 1, which is now a low threshold space at 112. Um, it holds uh, 25 houses, 25 previously unsheltered individuals uh, who are experiencing substance use. And in addition, in conjunction or collaboration with St. Francis House, we also established Willows, a low threshold housing program for women on the fifth floor of the BPHC Woods Mullen Women's Shelter. We also met the needs of this population by providing over 7,300 meals to other low threshold sites in the city and established transportation services to take people who are currently in the Mass and Cass um, area to nearby day services. To meet our goal of making homelessness rare, brief, and transitional, in FY23 we plan to increase the percentage of new guests receiving triage services and navigation uh, from the shelter to a long-term permanent housing pathway. We are also working in partnership with Project Place, St. Francis House, and Pine Street Inn to establish a workforce development service, and that's really obviously Im important, and that will be within the Boston you know, continuum of care for unsheltered individuals. In addition, you may have already heard from Chief Sheila Dillon that we are moving towards and engaged in shelter transformation. So I think it's important to talk about this a little bit because what we're trying to do is make shelter spaces you know, better for people, make them easier to access, make them better places to stay, as well as keeping them as transitional spaces for people so that they can move on to a permanent pathway. So within Woods Mullen, the women's shelter phase two construction is ongoing, including a new elevator, entrance, guest bathrooms, and a health clinic. And this should finish by the end of the year. In the 112 Southampton Street shelter, Entryway project redesign. Uh, we'll be having, we'll have a, a greeting station there, a sedation monitoring site for individuals uh, experiencing substance use disorder, an expanded weight area, as well as a new outside courtyard so that people are not um, on the street around South, Southampton, Atkinson, and in the surrounding area. They'll actually have a place to go and um, have a, you know, inter interact with community at this, in this courtyard area. We're also working to provide recovery and harm reduction services on site by adding four harm reduction specialists or recovery coaches and establishing staff training in that area. I think that this is another um, important piece as we try to make this a place where people who are experiencing substance use disorder um, can be and, and you know access services. Let's go to the next slide. Oh, 
think I did. Okay. So we're at Recovery Services Bureau. Um, and so essentially, as you all are probably well aware, the Recovery Services Bureau um, accomplished an enormous amount in this fiscal year. They made more than 1,800 placements in treatment programs across the state. In the first 10 months of the year, um, our residential substance use treatment programs serve 758 people, and that's, this is on our Mattapan campus. So this is Entre Familia, Transitions, and the Win Recovery Program. You all are probably well aware that we opened a new engagement center building, which provides essential basic needs and services, including access to medical care, substance use treatment referrals, housing referrals, legal services, and basic bathroom facilities. And on January 12th, our team, including Recovery Services, as well as the Homeless Services Bureau, and a number of key stakeholders across the um, city and city departments moved 145 people from the encampments um, that were located on Atkinson and Newmarket from tents to low threshold housing. A key accomplishment uh, was getting folks there and actually you know, getting them connected to services once they are there. And the goal now is to ensure that they have access and to hopefully move them into permanent, permanent housing as well as treatment. Recovery Services also created a low uh, threshold employment um, program in conjunction with the New Market Business Association providing work opportunities for 56 individuals experiencing homelessness. And 17 of those individuals have been hired into meaningful long-term employment. So that's a, a good outcome. We've worked to address barriers to entering shelter and to transitional housing, um, in addition to the work to transform our shelters and creating new transitional housing. We've also partnered with community organizations to implement a program allows, allowing unhoused individuals to store their items, which is uh, a big deal. These are things that belong to people, so having storage space available is important. In regards to community engagement, there has been a, a significant effort over the course of the last year with the Nubian Square Community Engagement Team working to develop a team of folks from that community who do outreach, engage uh, unsheltered individuals, uh, particularly those who are uh, living with substance use disorder, to uh, engage in housing, shelter, treatment, um, harm reduction. This was a collaborative effort with BPD, the local businesses, as well as MBTA. So more work in this area of community engagement is um, upcoming in the next fiscal year. Alongside this crisis response, we also delivered opioid overdose prevention to more than 5,000 individuals in Boston. We partnered with Boston Fire Department to conduct 264 home visits with the post-overdose response team. We distributed more than 26,000 doses of naloxone and removed over 1 million syringes from the city streets and parks through the Community Syringe Redemption Program. In addition, I think it's important to mention that we developed a harm reduction toolkit, which has been disseminated and utilized by the community um, health centers as they attempt to increase their harm, harm reduction work. I also want to mention something that's, uh, I think, unique and important in relationship to what was talked about uh, this morning. We have been working, you know, very closely with a number of youth-focused community-based organizations to develop a youth uh, substance use prevention program, and it is an online youth engagement portal called the COPE Code Club. As we all probably know, a lot of um, issues with, with kids in terms of them starting use of drugs relate to anxiety and depression and trauma. And this is actually a really nice portal. I wish we had included some pictures in this um, uh, presentation. It's a great you know, thing that's, that is well utilized and you know, hopefully will continue to in years to come because I think it works really well with the youth themselves. It has a youth advisory board, it has a community advisory board, and I think it's, it's definitely something that uh, we should continue to invest in. In terms of new items for the fiscal year 23, I think that Recovery Services has done a lot and will continue to build on and will need to continue to build on these core services, particularly in the Mass and Cass neighborhood, but certainly not just there across the city of Boston. It's really important. We will be expanding low threshold and harm reduction fo focused spaces throughout the city. We're looking for new day spaces so people can you know, have access to harm reduction as well as um, access services elsewhere, not just at the engagement center. 
And then in addition, I think that it's been really important to do community engagement. And I think we're all well aware of the disproportionately high rates of overdose amongst black individuals, particularly black men. So we are planning to invest in community-led engagement teams in three Boston neighborhoods where communities have been disproportionately impacted. This would be similar to the work that has been done um, in Nubian Square, but you know, expanded, improved upon as you, know, you learn as you go. And I think that it's, it's going to be critically important because these issues are certainly not just limited to any one group or limited to the Mass and Cass area. Um, and just uh, one final thing, and then I'll turn it to Chief Hooley. There is a warm weather plan and a longer term plan in regards to um, substance use disorder, particularly in the Mass and Cass area, but beyond. That will be um, unveiled by the mayor's office soon that will provide more um, overview and insight into you know, sort of the, the way forward or the path forward um, in regards to a lot of the issues that the Recovery Service Bureau engages in. So I'll turn it to uh, Chief Hooley. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Oh, I covered it. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. We this, this is on, right? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. I can hear you. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, hey, good afternoon, everybody. And just, just real quick, by means of introduction, I'm joined by a couple of folks here today. Uh, me to my left, Deputy Superintendent Lee Alexander. Uh, end of the table, uh, Superintendent Chief uh, John Gill. And up behind me, we have Cynthia Hamway. She's our our, basically our director of admin and finance budget every, uh, uh, as we have our own small unit uh, you know mirroring what's going on at the commission of the 1010 and the uh, assistant chief of staff Aaron Serino uh, who did an awful, a lot of work pulling all this uh, materials together for me and the fact that we know we're going to get questions we always want to deliver promptly on re questions responses here so we'll all be taking in information and and uh, and when I get stumped, which happens a lot, these folks also know the answers to a lot of questions, and I'm not ashamed to say that, and I get them with me. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jim Hooley. I serve as the, uh, and this is for slide one, so I'm going to go through the slides real quick with my remarks so they, so they overlap. Um, I've uh, served as the chief now for 12 years, and I couldn't be prouder of the men and women who serve the pre-hospital needs for the city of Boston. This has been another difficult year. Uh, uh, with the continuing uh, COVID, the rise in call volume, and the demands on our service. But I personally have risen to the challenges uh, serving the residents with professionalism and clinical excellence. Uh, slide two, uh, that's uh, basically an overview. You can see on there, uh, I, don't, I don't have to read the uh, numbers to you. I'm sure you, you have the slides as far as uh, numbers of calls, but so in uh, 1996, uh, a law was enacted um, that uh, created the Boston Public Health Commission. And as part of that, uh, we used to be part of the, the city's Department of Health and Hospital, same as Boston City Hospital. Uh, uh, we uh, rolled in uh, with the uh, commission. Uh, we are now, we are a two-tiered 911 EMS system, which means we operate basic life support and advanced life support ambulances, uh, 21 on during peak times, 21 basic life support ambulances, five advanced life support ambulances during the uh, uh, peak day and evening shifts. And uh, we tailor our staffing by hours of the day. Our lowest staffing levels are between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m., which does correspond with our uh, uh, lower demand. Uh, we also uh, uh, staff personnel up in our uh, dispatch operations center where we have two supervisors and six uh, EMTs on duty on the peak shifts and on the uh, overnight shift we have two supervisors and uh, five on there. Uh, we added two additional BLS ambulances back in the early days of the COVID crisis. One to help with, uh, uh, in we didn't see an increase of calls back then initially, but the uh, degree of difficulty, turning calls around, cleaning trucks, the PPE, and uh, we, we, we we knew that we were going to need more help out there. We did that basically through uh, the use of uh, overtime. Uh, this is something I'll address later. As we are looking to sustain these uh, two additional units through a fiscal uh, year uh, 23 investment. 
Uh, back in 2022, we, we responded to 126,790 clinical incidents, and that was a 10 percent increase from the prior year, with uh, 160 uh, thousand 160 577. Uh, ambulance responses. Uh, sometimes you send more than one unit uh, to a call, ALS, BLS, or two BLS, or a supervisor. So those, those are what responses are. But the significant thing there was even then, it was uh, there was 79,210 transports in that uh, calendar year. In total, we currently have 427 full-time positions. Through the FY23 investments that we seek, we are looking to increase this to 451 total uh, for the uh, fiscal year coming up. On slide three, um, the charts there are, I just want to demonstrate that our personnel are our highest priority. You know, in fact, out of our budget, that is certainly, the, like most city departments, that is the, you know, the highest portion of our, uh, of our expenditures. Uh, our, uh, non-personnel line is like $10 million, just up slightly from $9 million from last year. But our personnel are highest priority. The city has been responsive to our request uh, in the past to increase the number of personnel within Boston EMS, and our department has uh, grown uh, uh, over the years. We added 20 FTEs in FY17, four in FY18, another 20 in FY19, and then four in FY20, with no changes over the past two years. Uh, well, the, uh, most of our hirings, last, all of our hirings the last two years has been to try to uh, keep up with uh, attrition. We hope to add an additional 24 in FY23 with that investment that we have uh, presented. The majority of our members uh, are EMTs, uh, the base of the life support, they uh, do the bulk of the calls. They're working in ambulances and in dispatch operations. Uh, we have 11% uh, of our employees have the rank of uh, paramedic. Uh, they work in the advanced life support units uh, principally. And we have uh, another 11% who serve in supervisory roles, lieutenants, captains, uh, including those in uh, uh, operations, field operations, dispatch operations, and our training divisions. Uh, the remaining 6% are of our total uh, positions are non-uniform, and that would include our mechanics, our materials management, uh, budget, uh, staff, IT, communications, engineering, our facilities, and uh, our administrative personnel. The chart on the right, uh, the bar graphs, uh, shows you the average years of service for members in each rank. It illustrates two important facts. One, we, we are, for the most part, able to retain a lot of years, a lot of historical knowledge, a lot of collective intelligence that gets passed down, and we are able to retain. Uh, uh, and that qu positively does improve our quality of care and impacts that. But uh, number two, it does show that uh, promotion positively does impact retention, where we uh, supervisors rarely leave prior to um, retirement, uh, the same way with uh, uh, for, uh, people in management, and for the most part, uh, a lot of our paramedics. Uh, slide four. Okay. Diversity and race. Uh, as a department, we do see a great value in reflecting the community that we serve. We currently have 120 members who identify as American Indian, Alaskan, Native, Asian, Black, Hispanic, or Latino Pacific Islanders or two or more races. That represents 29% of our personnel who report of race. Well, we do have a small percentage who decline to report. Uh, this is an increase of 115 uh, uh, compared to last year, and uh, no, uh, an increase from 115 last year and 107 uh, the year prior. Increases in overall department diversity is achieved through our EMT hiring process. That's our gateway into the job, and that's where we've uh, really been placing a lot of our focus, trying to uh, uh, develop, uh, develop the pool, uh, develop the farm team out there, if you will. 
Because we are constrained by the prerequisite to, to be hired to work here as an EMT, you have to be certified as an EMT by the state. You had to have gone through that process and that training. There are, um, I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, in a second, but we have, there are a lot of places that you can, you can already be an EMT when you apply here. You could have sought certification at a lot of programs across the Commonwealth. Uh, however, uh, we do offer twice a year what we've called a, uh, our community EMT program. It's often on site. It's uh, our program as a uh, priority for city residents first. We, have to, we only take city residents to begin with. Only after that will we open it to other paying members. Uh, it runs twice a year. It's been our largest feeder, if you will, of persons coming into our uh, system. Uh, coming in sitting for our exams. In the last few years, we've even been able to uh, uh, enhance that, lower some of the barriers by our program is uh, we, we cover our expenses with it. And uh, we also were, prob were at least half the cost, if not less, of uh, the programs that are available in community colleges and other places in the state. So we, we do try to keep it uh, um, uh, affordable. Uh, for people who are just even just thinking of becoming an EMT. Uh, we have a program that we work with the Office of Workforce Development, uh, City Academy, which uh, gives basically scholarships to city residents who have come in for their program, who, uh, who have applied to them, who take a bridge course with them or with us, especially which is really good for folks who maybe been out of school for a couple of years and you want to get back into like the study habits because a lot of things in an EMT class and even later in a paramedic program are studying different modules, different protocols. There's a lot of required testing required by the state, the National Registry, who certify people. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of uh, test taking involved in it. But we, we really work to try to put people in good position. Our EM, community EMT program has a very high success rate for our people from Boston residents who take our course and complete it uh, have a very high pass rate, uh, first time pass rate for the uh, state exams, both practical and uh, uh, the uh, written. So we're, we're proud to say that. And again, that's one of our, it also gives us a chance to keep an eye on uh, potential candidates for us to start recruiting our early then. Uh, the second part for developing personnel, we recognize that in our paramedic paramedic ranks right now, percentage-wise, that's our uh, least uh, diverse promotional rank uh, right at this time. Uh, we, uh, last year, we promoted three people from the paramedic ranks into management ranks, two deputy superintendents, uh, I'm sorry, a deputy, yeah, two deputy superintendents, I'm sorry, two of the paramedics who came up uh, to the deputy superintendent rank had worked for us before as paramedics, so, uh, but we welcomed them into uh, uh, their, their jobs now as uh, shift commanders. Uh, the department's affinity group, uh, USEP, the United Coalition of EMS Providers, has been uh, a great ally in working uh, for this because they were able to uh, actively uh, seek and secure scholarships for members of uh, that organization. So, uh, for, for uh, they've gotten uh, grants and other scholarships to cover the uh, cost and be able to offer uh, scholarships for members who are seeking paramedic certification training. A total of 10 EMTs who work for Boston EMS, who also just by being virtues of uh, membership in uh, USEP, uh, were able to apply and get the cost of the paramedic certification uh, covered uh, in a program they're taking at uh, Bunker Hill. Uh, and they're in their second year right now. And FY23, upon completing the course and securing state certification, uh, they'll be eligible, eligible to apply for the promotional exam for a paramedic as well. So we're really looking forward to that. Slide five, and I know I only have 10 minutes, so I'll try to go quick. Uh, continuing with the focus on our personnel. Chief, you actually have about a minute left. Oh, okay. Quick, quick, quick. Um, we'll extend that again to another three minutes. Is that okay to wrap okay. up? I'll try to fly now. Uh, this is uh, FY22 accomplishments in our ongoing fiscal year. We see uh, uh, 
They'll list it up there. I won't, so I won't read all my things. So personal safety, wellness, and advancement. That's been our priority uh, and, and, for, and for accomplishments uh, last year. Uh, we've, one of it was uh, workplace wellness, annual, annual wellness checks. We're trying to work with our peer support system. Uh, we do one-on-one -on -one meetings with counselors so people can meet uh, privately. Uh, we've, uh, we're trying to get our, uh, uh, to bring an additional counselor onto that contract so we can uh, do that. We've developed our own in-house infection control team to deal with COVID, uh, to deal with uh, people with testing uh, positives to this day. You know, we had to put a couple of people out this week, even with a very high uh, uh, rate of, of vaccination, we're still, uh, uh, we're still experiencing, even people have been boosted, so it's, uh, it's difficult. So, but we, uh, we have a very effective infection control team. Um, on the front, uh, okay, look real quick. This is slide seven, uh, eight. Can't read it. Okay, that's just a number of COVID calls, and I'll skip that because I, you probably heard a bit about COVID this morning. Um, Okay, we come back to, uh, I think these ones are rather important, I just want to go quick. Uh, uh, advancements in patient care, the next three slides are gonna cover accomplishments, goals, and investments uh, for the next uh, year. This past year, we contract, we contract with a company by the name of Cording to incorporate artificial intelligence in our 911 call taking process. Uh, with the work with work on the system development and integration this past year, we plan for it to go live in FY23. Initially, the focus will be on cardiac arrest incidents. You know, our most uh, sensitive one. We want to make sure that we don't miss those. The call taking point, uh, where information such as subtleties as patient breathing may be used as an early alert to our EMT call taker regarding uh, life threatening condition. Uh, we're uh, using grant funding as an additional proof of concept uh, as we rolled out uh, mechanical chest compressions to all of our frontline ambulances this year. This serves as a valuable tool for our personnel when, for caring and cardiac arrest. These are uh, uh, mechanical devices that we put on people that they keep up and they sustain cardiac compressions. Uh, during a CPR, they've been uh, proven to show uh, increase in survival in some settings uh, so we can uh, continue with other things uninterrupted and it's uh, it also it helps uh, 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 keep our people able to do that physically that's a, a very demanding thing to do a uh, long resuscitations okay uh, enhanced behavioral health okay while caring for the needs of patients experiencing behavioral health emergency health has always been uh, emergency Behavioral health emergency has always been important to us. We've been working concertedly to, for a novel approach to response model for, for that. 2021, we responded to 10,203 calls that were type coded as EDP, or emotionally disturbed persons. 5,696 of those were EDP2s, where the patients determined to be possibly a threat to themselves or others, and the other 4,500 were lower acuity acuity EDP threes. Uh, this calendar year, uh, you know, we're still, we're, we're still seeing consistent numbers with that. Uh, so for the first part, we've, we've rolled out a three-part training to all of our personnel to build in our own ability to take care of our own mental health and our patients experiencing a mental health crisis. Uh, as components of a mobile integrated healthcare model, we're planning to roll out two new s services to patients. The first will be at the point of the 911 call. Patients having low acuity behavioral health emergency will be screened by our EMT call takers at the dispatch operations for eligibility for a warm handoff to a master's level behavioral health clinician at the Boston Emergency Medical, Boston Emergency Services team, the best call center uh, at Boston Medical. If they meet that criteria, REMS call taker will ask the patient's approval to be transferred to that bridge. 
uh, connection. The best clinician will then speak to the patient, determine the best support that patient's uh, behavioral needs. They'll connect them to appropriate services, uh, which may not include uh, the dispatch of an ambulance, and it may not include transport to an emergency room. It could improve other services direct from best. If at any time it's determined the patient requires an ambulance response, the call will be transferred back to us. The second component of our new behavioral health response model will include a specialized unit staffed with Boston EMS, EMTs, and a best clinician. This field unit will be able to respond to calls and provide on-scene assistance, including treatment in place, as well as recommendations for an alternative destination transport, uh, routing the patient directly to appropriate services rather than a hospital emergency department. This unit is intended to complement and not to replace the Boston Police Co-Responder Program, which is already in place and has been helpful. So we're requesting an additional four positions to help support this alternative uh, response unit, uh, this, this pilot, similar to when we started our CAT unit, uh, our, our community assistance team, or Squad 80, a few years ago. Members assigned to this unit will receive some enhanced training to prepare them for the new role. We're confident both comp components of this new role will be operational in FY23. And uh, this is a significant change in operations, something we are approaching in a comprehensive manner uh, with uh, approval from other departments, including the State Office of EMS. Uh, in addition to, uh, slide nine, in addition to, and just that graph up there, I just want you to see uh, both did, uh, why we need the, uh, the 20 people in addition to that four. Uh, in addition to the four FTEs, we also put in for 20 FTEs to formally incorporate the two frontline ambulances that we added during our COVID-19 response. We had two additional ambulances on days and evenings. We staffed them on overtime back then uh, to help us with response times, and uh, uh, we found them invaluable. Uh, this, ex these extra units allowed us to meet our response time goal in 2020, which a median response time for priority one of six minutes. Uh, you know, for the last several months, we've been slipping to 6.3, and uh, you know we do need that uh, those additional units to try to uh, eat, uh, to even try to get back to our minimum uh, uh, response goals that we set for priority one calls. That chart on the slide shows the daily calls by the month. Um, and you can see that uh, that it does vary uh, by uh, by month, by time of year, and how the uh, uh, 2019 versus the 2020, uh, the orange line. And I won't uh, go all through that, but uh, this year in yellow, which is important, shows that we continue to show an upward trend. And uh, if we want to meet that demand in a world where COVID is still continuing, we do feel that uh, that's why we did put in for the uh, additional 20 positions that we would need to uh, staff these two additional units. Uh, and I already spoke about a little bit about recruitment, and I already talked about the EMT class and how we set that up and how we want to keep working on community engagement. And we uh, we did have, uh, and thank you, Council Baker, I saw yesterday at the graduation. Uh, and uh, let me see. Oh, so I already talked about recruitment and um, that. And then, okay, last slide. In closing, I want to thank you all for the continued report, support throughout the year. And we'll be back here tomorrow for understand for our EMS Week proclamation at 12. And thank you, Chief. Sorry it took so long. That's okay. Uh, thank you. Um, First, uh, sorry, we'll go to Council President Ed Flynn. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to the EMS team that's here on the panel. Thank you, Dr. Ojakutu, for the tremendous work you are doing, and also Chief Hooley, who we've, we've worked with for, for many years and have great, great respect for you, Chief. Um, myself and Councilor Flaherty, especially, um, have been advocating for an EMS presence, as you know, down at the South Boston waterfront, 
that neighborhood continues to grow, whether it's residents and employees, visitors, tourists. Um, so I know that there is a planned EMS station in South Boston waterfront, which is a top priority for, for me and for Council Flaherty as well. Can you give us a little bit of an update on that, Chief? Uh, yeah, I'm I'll, I'll happy to uh, tell you what, what, what I do know. I know for, uh, for, for several years they, were, they had been looking at uh, the city, even going back to the Menino administration, trying to look at uh, different models to get a presence down there. Uh, whether it was going to be partnering with uh, private developers who are trying to find some city land to build on or co-locating with other programs. Uh, a few years ago, uh, the city invested uh, capital, about $100,000 initially to do a programming mm -hmm. and to look at the various options, lay them out, the study was done, and that was turned into, was it? property management and capital construction, I'm mm -hmm. going to show you the right departments. And they come up with a, you know, a couple of different uh, models. They looked at the size of trucks, maybe ambulances, and they mapped that out. Uh, they then went back and started working on siting. So they did the programming and they decided, yes, we determined that we did have the need. Uh, they also, on the uh, um, siting, they actively looked at a few spots. They looked at uh, uh, one parcel that was on Dry Dock Ave, and they determined that it was too small even for a uh, single bay station. I mean, the parcel was so small, and one of the reasons mm -hmm. it's still available, it's not really big enough for commercial development, and it's it, and it does literally abut the Dry Dock. Uh, this past year, uh, the BPDA and the city we're discussing land farther down at the end of Dry Dock, down by this one small, excuse me, uh, restroom comfort station that was built down there by a, by the end. It was an area down where there used to be a trailer that the Boston Police Harbor Unit used to work out of. Mm -hmm. And uh, they did some looking at that, mm -hmm. and they d determined that there was enough land size, square footage down there to make that viable. And uh, they then moved on to the design phase, and they actually they put some more money into it mm -hmm. last year, and they came up with a couple potential designs for a two bay facility, with the idea of it being a, uh, a green building and planning. And uh, the there was a hearing, I believe, at uh, BPDA where they did a a land thing where they moved the land, they transferred that land to to the commission, and. I see in capital budget, there was a, so a submission in here for FY23 for uh, uh, to, to $10 million, $15,000, which would start to go towards uh, construction as well. So it, uh, is, so the siting, the programming, the siting, and the design, from my experience, have always been the first three big things to. Mm -hmm to get done or anything, so I'm very encouraged by what I'm seeing. Yeah, thank you, Chief. I am too. Um, it's taken uh, taken a long time, but thank you to, to you and to your team for advocating for it. I also want to thank the um, BPPA EMS division, the union that have been advocating for it as well. My neighbors in South Boston, obviously, Councilor, Councilor Flaherty, um, that's going to be a tremendous asset to the neighborhood. Um, and as we know, as I mentioned, the number of residents um, and visitors continue to grow. Chief, what is the, what is the response time for, um, for one of the ambulances to get into, um, into the South Boston waterfront for a priority one? I don't have that right here at my fingertips. Okay. I, I will get that for you. That, that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, I do know that when we first started uh, looking at this back, and anybody who was here even 10, 15 years ago, when that was just parking lots during the daytime and Anthony's Pier 4 at night, when there wasn't much down there, there wasn't much down there. Mm -hmm. But with all the development down there, that's been our, our citywide average. Our calls typically go up citywide about one to two, two percent a year, which doesn't seem like much, but when you're dealing with over a hundred thousand, yeah, that's a couple of thousand calls a year. For from about two thousand seven on, 
uh, the seaport district was the fastest growing area percentage of, that was really driving the number of yeah. calls for us because of all the development. Yes. One of, one of my other priorities is getting a, a fire presence down there as well. I had a, a major, major company call me up and say to me, um, hey, Flynn, how come, how come you don't have an EMS station? You don't have a fire station down this South Boston waterfront. You want all these big um, national, international companies to go there, but you're not providing any, any basic city services. And the residents have said that to me and, and Council Flaherty as well. So I know it's a top priority for you, Chief. So that's, in, you know, if we want to continue developing in that area, which I think we all want to, we need to make sure that we have basic city services. That includes police, that includes fire, EMS, a public library eventually. Um, but let me, let, me st let me stop there for a second. Then the other, the other one I wanted to focus on, COVID. Um, during this pandemic, your team, rank and file members, men and women, went out there every day helping so many people with COVID, but also with other medical issues. You referenced health and wellness of your employees mm -hmm. during your presentation. What are we doing to make sure that the health and wellness of the rank and file of your team is addressed? That's a, that's a major priority for me and for my, my colleagues as well. But we want to make sure that they are given the needed services, assistance, um, respect that they've, that they've demonstrated to the residents for so many, so many years, especially during this difficult time. So that's also a priority for me, and I'm, I'm sure it's a priority for my, my colleagues as well. Okay, yeah, no, it's, it's certainly a priority for us as well, Council. Thank you for, for raising that. Uh, well, again, just you know, getting back to spe specific for COVID, you know, right, right from the beginning, before we even saw the, that first initial peak and surge, uh, you know, on the one hand, we were, we were fortunate that we had uh, stockpiled, maybe is the right word, but we had sufficient stores initially of different PPE because uh, we learned some of that from H1N1. We learned some of that from some of the Ebola scares and a few different things. We had various levels of PPE. And, uh, and even going back to this department prepared for uh, the possible re-release re into the world of uh, uh, Smallpox, if you remember, back mm -hmm. after 2001, when some of those potential threats were going out there, and we had people here who had trained and revaccinated again for that, and so we were always trying to take a proactive stance for that. Uh, but when we we began to uh, uh, the process again, re recommitted to the idea of uh, doing uh, annual fit testing for our personnel to make sure that even our regular mask, our, our N95 masks, that the ones that you have will pass testing, quantitative testing. We, we do that because sometimes people's features change. Mm -hmm. They gain weight, they lose weight, whatever. Uh, you want to make sure that those fit, that you're not just going through the motions, that you're doing stuff correctly. Uh, we do that. Uh, we we uh, we do keep a variety of ones on uh, available, and if not, we go out we source them to, for people. Uh, we try to uh, keep various levels of respiratory protection available for that. Uh, on some of the other PPE, you know, several years ago, many years ago, actually, we we invested in uh, uh, soft body armor for our personnel. Uh, to make that optional for them in case we needed it for some certain situations, although there are occasions where we would require people to use it if we were in support of maybe a police operation. After what we saw what happened in other cities and the pro proliferation of long guns and mm -hmm. uh, rifles, what we saw like happening even in Paris or Orlando, we invested in uh, the higher level ballistic gear that we don't give that to every single person, but we issue that in the ambulances. So. You know, you know, God forbid if we're even standing by or standing off someplace, uh, we, it's hard to tell sometimes we, we, how close a range it could be. So, but we fit people for that. And we, we, so we, we take 
we try to take a lot of that serious. On the, uh, uh, again, we've committed on the uh, COVID, but, but we've brought in a full-time uh, nurse uh, for that, as well as, uh, and at times, we contracted out with uh, the agencies to bring two, three, some of them on, so we would have 24-hour coverage for that. And uh, if, we, if you get another surge, we bring them back on. But we've, but we're, we're never going to go below what we've brought, but, but, but what we have right now. The, uh, oh, okay. And uh, the last thing on your, uh, your question about uh, uh, personnel, for a new offering for our personnel this year, we've enhanced the contract we have, and I mentioned this earlier, with our on-site academy and our peer support program to include annual wellness checks for all of our personnel. With the idea that, yes, some people will seek help, will go to counseling that we make available, that we have it available remotely now. We have uh, PS4 people trained, that people can anonymous, you know, quietly get, engage and uh, uh, get services from clinicians. We don't want to wait for people to have to uh, have a crisis to go see them. What we're trying to do is arrange, it would be voluntary for people to uh, arrange for hours to meet with clinicians where if they want to uh, 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 discuss things now, before things come to a mm -hmm. crisis, uh, that, we, that we'll be able to do that. Well, thank you, Chief, and I know my time is up. I want to say thank you to, um, to you, Chief, but also I want to thank your, the, your rank and file men and women during this pandemic, they were the real unsung heroes in this city. So we just want to say, say thank you to them and to acknowledge the um, incredible work that they've done for the residents of Boston. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Council President Flynn. Council Murphy, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, um, Chief Hooley and all the EMS who are here. And I will echo what President Flynn has already said, but um, I do want to start by just thanking you and everyone who have been there before. We know that your job was hard and you were always the first one to show up and arrive and COVID really made it more difficult, but you were always there being so professional and there when people need you most. So it's a stressful job and I appreciate that. So thank you for that. And yesterday I was um, happy to join the largest graduating class of the 30 recruits and I saw on the side, um, that there's a new class 10 days in, but every hearing we have, we're talking about staffing shortages. And is this amount of recruits coming in, do we need to support more coming on? Is this going to relieve the shortages that we are experiencing? Thank you, uh, mm -hmm. I, one, thank you for the kind words and uh, thanks for uh, uh, you know, to make it in. I know the council it was all, all the councils have been very busy this week. It was a tough timing for graduation, but uh, we appreciate all your support. We have, um, the positions that we have right now that we've been filling will get us to the budget ones that we already had available. Mm -hmm. uh, we, like, like I said, we were with, with the, with retirements, with some, uh, uh, and some other folks who, you know, who, who have left, we've, we've lost some people in recent uh, months to uh, uh, police departments are hiring, fire departments are hiring, but, uh, but also we have people who, you know, go to get into PA programs, you know, they really like the medicine, uh, or they like nursing, uh, they really like what we're doing here, but sometimes they like, they might look at it and say, you know, how many, more third floor carries do I have in my back, and maybe I'd rather do this in a nice air conditioned hospital instead of another summer here. But for whatever reason, some people move on. Uh, so we we're, we're always trying to uh, keep up with that. We do get concerned that COVID may have uh, slowed down either the, the number of people trying to come in to the uh, profession or uh, accelerated uh, people leaving from it. Uh, Private ambulance companies across the state are experiencing problems right now, trying to staff. And uh, a lot of municipal, and, and most of those municipal, they could be fire-based ones, are uh, having a hard time attracting uh, uh, EMTs and paramedics who, and I just look very attractive to them because they get a world's worth of experience here in a couple of months than compared to what they may see in this sleepy town in 10 years. 
Uh, so right now, if uh, say this next recruit class comes in and passes uh, and everybody sticks through, stays it out, then we would probably be uh, able to uh, get up to just where our current vacancies would be. But we would have the potential to be getting this another class on, uh, maybe even as soon as uh, September, uh, with uh, approval in the budget process for the uh, uh, 24 additional positions that we seek to try to, uh, to expand. Uh, because that would really be the first time. The, the positions that we have currently funded now, prior to the additional ones that we are seeking, we're, they would be getting us to a staffing level that we were initially approved for back in 2009. And uh, we have then, our largest recruit class ever, was supposed to start, uh, I think it was going to be 40 or 44 people, and with five days to go, that class got canceled and froze along with some police and fire classes with, I I don't know if it was the, uh, the real estate bubble burst, or I forget which particular thing that drove cuts in federal aid. There was a bit of recession then. And uh, we, those positions, uh, we never got those 40 back. We spent the next 10 years filling, doing attrition. Mm -hmm. uh, so with those ones that I detailed to you in my remarks that we got 10 a few years ago, then 10 more, than whatever, we, we finally got we finally got to where we would have been 10 years ago. So we, with the investment this year, we'll be able to you know, really try to play catch up and try to meet some of the demand that we have today. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna switch to the homelessness. So um, I am the chair of the newly formed commission to end family homelessness. And I know as a Boston public school teacher, I saw firsthand how that disruption and the devastation it causes our children well, one thing I'm finding out is many um, of the resources like home vouchers um, are only given to BPS families. And so we run out of vouchers when then we need to support our families and children that may be outside of the BPS system. And when we look at the budget projections, so we increased from 21 to 22 under the Homelessness Service Bureau 1.66 million dollars, but for this coming budget, we've only increased 600,000. So, d did we increase enough money, and in to make sure that we're keeping up? Because we know many families pre-COVID sure doubled up or lived in families together. It's one of the reasons we're seeing more families having to go to shelters because they, because of COVID and other reasons, don't feel safe, like living with other family members, like lots of different reasons. And COVID itself has caused, you know, more people losing jobs. And so are we investing enough to make sure that we're, you know, because when we're running out of vouchers and then we have kids in, you know, charter schools or other schools that we're not able to then find supports for. Mm -hmm. So I will have to look into that more closely. I didn't, I, I do believe we should always, you know, be in, investing more, you know, mm -hmm. not, you know, the, the amount that you, you mentioned, but I'll, I'll get some more information as to why that okay. amount is okay. included. That'll be helpful. Um, and then on the mass and cast, and just wondering what data do we have with those who we moved from the tents to the low threshold housing for mm -hmm. success? So I do want to go on record that I'm definitely in support of recovery and those nonprofits that have a successful track record in recovery services like the Gavin Foundation, the Phoenix Gym, others that I know are supporting those struggling with this. But what's, because I, I drive by often and I know the warm weather, we knew that there'd be more crowds, but everyone should drive home up Mass Ave today, mm -hmm. and what you'll see is devastating, mm -hmm. and it's not better, you mm -hmm. know. So, mm -hmm. we what what, and I know you said the mayor is coming out with a plan about mm -hmm. the warm weather, but are we ready for the needs, and what track record of success do we have? Mm -hmm. So this is an incredibly important question that you're asking. As I mentioned, initially 145 people were moved into the low threshold housing sites from the encampments. And 
approximately 200 total have been moved in. So mm -hmm. some have gone to permanently permanent housing, some have gone into treatment, and a smaller proportion have been lost to follow up. Um, we are aggregating that data and we're also getting qualitative data from those people who are in the low threshold housing because we need to understand what's happening with them and what, where they are in their journey. And we'll just, mm -hmm. we'll call it a, a journey, hopefully to recovery and permanent housing. We have a um, survey that's out now. We've surveyed 36 or so of those individuals who were initially housed. It has been a bit of a slow process because it's a tr it tends to be a transient population, though they do have a place to sleep at night. We're working on getting that done, and I'm hoping in the next month or so we'll have you know results that could be reported out. The actual plan that the mayor is going to release, I believe, next week is both the, the warm weather plan, which is what you're seeing right now, and I agree everybody should drive past, um, but it's also the mid and long term plan. So a lot of the questions that you may have in regards to what the city plans to do about this problem, not just in Mass and Cass, but beyond, um, will be it's exactly, spreading. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. That that should be that will be out soon, I believe, next week. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Council Murphy. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all for uh, being here uh, today and for leading our city through uh, extraordinary difficult times. Um, Boston Public Health Commission and our EMS uh, deliver some of the most critical uh, services in our city and are truly, uh, particularly among our 911 uh, call dispatchers, uh, the, unhung, the unsung heroes of our proactive as well as reactive emergency response uh, system. And uh, want to make sure we give a shout out to the 911 operators who are uh, overworked uh, and um, I guess. Um, if the word's underappreciated, uh, they seem to get lost in the shuffle with the big ticket items, and it goes from just 911 operators, EMS, BFT, and BPD, and we've had the same conversation um, where we're um, where we're losing good people, um, partly because of uh, salary, the working conditions. They don't get weekends off. It's just uh, it's um, got to the point where we're at a crisis, and I think if. We need to address it. Uh, I would like to see it addressed in this budget, along with BFD and BPD's budget, where we're actually respecting our 911 call dispatches, who are phenomenal. Uh, we had a call recently. That woman stayed on the phone uh, with that victim uh, well over an hour. Uh, guy was squished between two walls over near the back base station. We, she drops that call or tries to transfer that call. Uh, we probably don't find that guy for a decade until we do another capital project uh, over at uh, Back Bay Station. Among other things, if you listen to a fire command and you, you understand the critical role that these dispatchers play. but So I know that we're losing them, um, and I think that's a solvable problem. Uh, we need more of them. We need them to be paid better, and we need them to have shifts that are commensurate with them having a life and being able to sustain themselves and their families. And that doesn't happen. And that's a disgrace from my perspective. It's not, you know, it's not, nothing that you've caused, but I've had this discussion with BFT and uh, BFD and BTD. This budget has, we have to see changes, and I can't support that unless we support our 911 callers. They are critical to the work that you guys do, to the level of service that we provide. In a very short period of time, we're blessed in Boston. You can call 911 in a very, no matter where you are in the city, in a very short period of time, blue lights, orange lights, or red lights are coming to help. And the fact that the dispatches um, complete, continue to get disrespected in the process is, is, uh, is upsetting to me. So I want that addressed at some point um, in the resubmission. Uh, shifting gears, obviously, to, uh, to Mass and Cass, uh, I'm going to note that, uh, and as the Chair of Public Safety in this Council, uh, it deserves both a public health and a public safety response. Uh, in order for people to access these resources and to be connected to treatment, into new opportunities. We need to have a safe environment down there. There's chaos down there. And I'm starting to see it creep back up to those levels. Uh, and we need to jump on that uh, before uh, we lose control again. And we absolutely need to partner with uh, BPD, BFD, and in this, if necessary, the Mass State Police and our uh, MBTA police to ensure that uh, people who are down there trafficking drugs, people who are down there trafficking humans, people that are down there preying on vulnerable people, be removed from that area uh, for the sake of those seeking help uh, and trying to turn their lives around, uh, as well as the residents that live down there and the businesses uh, that do business down here. And in addition to those that uh, are lighting fires and uh, using open flame uh, to heat down there, all of it, uh, it has to go. And we need that partnership um, 
for, for, for you folks, obviously, to do what you guys do best, which is to provide that public health and to put uh, people back together. Uh, so just uh, opining, I guess, on that, which, which leads me to the question around the uh, engagement center, uh, obviously, because of a recent uptick in violence. Down there, the engagement center was closed. Um, you know, have, have our operations changed in response to the uptick in the violence? Uh, how are we ensuring that clients down there are going, that are going there for services and for help are being protected? How are we ensuring that the people that are actually down there doing the Lord's work are also protected uh, from, uh, from those that are down there not to get help, not to get treatment and recovery? They're down there to stir it up. They're down there to sell their wares. They're down there to be mischievous uh, and destructive. Uh, and because we don't, uh, we, we don't rely or we don't uh, have a better partnership maybe or we don't call um, you know, our police department when necessary, it allows it to fester and get out of control. So I appreciate your thoughts on the engagement center and what changes have been made to make it safer mm -hmm. for those seeking help but also for those providing the help. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Councillor Flynn, um, really important questions. So I just wanted to comment, um, first of all, that we are in collaboration with BPD on this issue. We know that this is a public safety and a public health emergency. Um, we can't do anything, um, at least not anything successfully, if we're not working together. Um, we've been meeting regularly. We just met this morning at 9 a.m. with um, C6 and the Street Outreach Unit to talk through some of what we're seeing. There has been this sense of escalation, and we definitely need to get on top of it. Part of the warm weather plan that I mentioned that will be released next week is, you know, an increased, you know, police presence. We've see, we've had an increased police mm -hmm. presence um, along that area, um, you know, with regular street cleans every day. The police are out. The police are helping us to refer people places. In terms of the engagement center specifically, so Atkinson Street is, has been closed. This has been going on for now two weeks plus. Um, the engagement center has been closed except for clinical services. We have people there who are accessing HIV treatment as well as prevention for HIV infection, hep C treatment. This is all really important. Mm -hmm. And so we've been navigating people down the street so they can get those services. Um, because of what's been happening, as you articulated very clearly, we wanted to make sure that the engagement center was safer, you know, safer not only for um, the people who are accessing it, but for our, um, our staff. So we put together a safety plan, which includes um, having a uh, metal detector in place, and that has been um, put in place, alarming the back gates, having campus police actually inside of the building, um, increasing staffing, a number of things, reducing, you know, people who can come in and out, um, limiting the line outside in front. Um, we're looking at, you know, closure of hours. All of this has been going on because, as you said, we need to make, make sure people are safe. So moving forward, um, the EC needs to be reopened so that people have access to the services, even like basic amenities like bathrooms mm -hmm. down there. Um, so it will be reopened, but only with these different safety concerns. And this plan and these safety um, measures have been discussed and worked on with BPD. Okay. And then the integrated, uh, those teams that do the housing navigation and the behavioral health, I believe it was uh, in the book that there's 210 clients mm -hmm. currently. Uh, how many are Boston residents? And if there are, if there are non-Boston residents, are we seeking reimbursement from their hometowns and their home communities? Okay, so are you referring to the street to home list? Or are you referring yeah, this, to the so this, so the so Yeah, so we've launched the two integrated teams. One's the housing navigation, mm -hmm. the other one's behavioral health. Yes. And they supply services to, I think it, it was identified as 210 mm -hmm. clients. Mm -hmm. And I just want to know, of the 210, how many of them are Boston residents? How many of them are not? And mm -hmm. for those that are not, are we seeking reimbursement from their respective hometowns and communities? Because it always falls on Boston. That's right. uh, the last yeah. census that was down, there was a significant amount of those individuals and poor souls down there were not from Boston mm -hmm. because their communities drop the ball, because their communities push it or leave it to us to solve everyone's uh, substance and abuse uh, treatment uh, problems, uh, affordable housing. All of it comes to Boston. The time has come for uh, our counterparts, suburban counterparts, to uh, to step up to the plate. And if I may just sneak in one last question. Mm -hmm. Commit, uh, Chief, you know, and I, I just did my first ride-along. I suggest to all of my colleagues, particularly the newer members, mm -hmm. please take full advantage of doing a ride-along with EMS uh, to see how dedicated, how sure. passionate, and how professional they are. Uh, it, it, obviously, it, uh, it enhanced uh, my appreciation for the work you did. But I also led the effort to get Group 4 for your members as council president, working alongside you and, and the uh, and EMS and, uh, and uh, BPPA for the, the union that represented the members. But I saw that the average years of service is 12 years. That's a little disheartening for me that 
uh, the retention, the average years of service for the current workforce um, via rank was 12 years of service. Do we lose them to other municipalities? Do we lose them to, um, I guess it's just the rigors of the job, arguably, but I, I was always hoping that Group 4 would help sort of stabilize and provide sort of a pathway to retirement for the men and women uh, that, uh, that work under you. And I just saw that uh, a significant number uh, obviously retire after, leave after 12 years. Can you just explain why that's the case? If, or if you, yeah. have a, if you have an answer or a solution and we can work together to make sure yeah, they stay sure. longer? I mean, uh, we do have a fair amount of people that are actually have moved on to a, a regular retirement. And uh, we've, uh, uh, we've had several people go out in the last couple of years. Again, not due to disability, not because years ago, you know, like, people retired from here were people who could, you know, right. disabled because of something. And it was, uh, you know, fortunately, when, when, when that was passed and uh, thank, you know, thankfully, the, uh, we, we did see a lot of people who stayed. We, we, what we've noticed is, uh, yes, if we can keep people beyond uh, a certain time frame, if we keep you, like, say, by 12 years or so, there's, there's a good chance we're going to be able to retain you. Okay. Uh, keep, or if you are able to, uh, uh, especially people who uh, are, are able to make it to supervisory ranks or mm -hmm. other ranks, stuff, they they tend to be lifers, okay. which is thank goodness for us that they do. Okay. And they impart a lot of the wisdom. I think in the first few years, and I don't know how much of it is now is just part of the, I don't want to say the great, what do they call it, the great things we're dealing with right. uh, the last couple of years is that you, you do see some movement where somebody will just right. decide I'm moving to California I'm, I'm like huh right but and, and some of those are even people who were born and raised here they weren't just people who moved here from somebody else and settled right. so it's right. uh, but we do lose some people to uh, other you know we just lost some folks to the state police uh, right. or uh, uh, and some of the uh, uh, suburban right. fire departments. Thank you, Chief. I appreciate that. I'm just concerned that 12 years with the burnout factor, if that's the case, that we need to address that as a city. It's probably contributing it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you Councilor Flaherty. Councilor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Chief Dooley, and thank you to everyone for being here this afternoon, and thank you for your service this last past few years. Very, very challenging time, and you folks were definitely at the front line taking thank care you. of us all. Um, I'm from Alston Brighton, Chief. <laughs> uh, do we have a, um, some response times for um, advanced life support to get to Alston Brighton these days? I, I ask this every year, so uh, if you don't have it at your fingertips, I'd love to know. Yeah, I, I can, yes, I can generate that. I, uh, I just, I don't have it, so I think to bring. Yeah, and, and the advanced life support tr truck is still, um, that we would, would, that would come to Alston Brighton is still based at, BI, is that correct? Yeah. That's and one of them, yes. It'll yeah. be a yes, down, down at uh, the Beth Israel campus down there. And uh, but but alternately sometimes uh, you know, the paramedic five comes across from the Faulkner, they come across from Brookline. I mean that was the truck I worked in years ago. We used to run to Brighton a lot. So that brings me to the question. I know we're talking about a, a new um, ambulance bay yeah. or a double bay at um, in, in Alston Brighton at St. Elizabeth. Um, just generally speaking, what arrangements do, does EMS have with host hospitals? Um, you know, is it uh, just what, what's the arrangement? Do they do they charge rent, or is it a, a, a gratis, or a, you t do you take care of maintenance and, and utilities? What, what's the what's the deal? So for the facilities that uh, that exist uh, currently. Uh, most were done basically as uh, they were hosting us, uh, m almost more in lines. And I don't know if back in the day if they called it community benefits, if it was tied to anything, but it was, uh, it basically was a community benefit. Uh, the, you know, the Faulkner Hospital, it wasn't uh, anything uh, fancy or exotic, but they had uh, uh, an email bay and they, they walled off the equivalent of two of the bays out of it. Uh, put a garage door on and in a mechanical room behind it built a small office space for us which was still very beneficial because it was a place you could shut the ambulance off and uh, you know plug it in put it on charge into a heated garage because we are supposed to have the ambulances in a heated garage uh, 
when they're not in service. Uh, so, and they, the Faulkner does not uh, charge us for that, and they originally fixed it up. They, and they take care of uh, some uh, overhaul. They cover the utilities there. Uh, we obviously pay for uh, any if we bring in special data lines or anything else, and that's that's on us. Uh, they put the initial garage door up, but we paid upkeep and, and manage that, or anything else we, we yeah. put in there, you know, furnishings, uh, painting, keeping it up. That's similar to a, a very small garage that we have at Kearney, where Kearney uh, built a single bay for us, and they provided no cost. Uh, it's between the old library school of nursing and a parking garage. Yeah. But they also provide parking for us, which is very key because our personnel carry these big, large brown bags with all their PPE and uh, equipment with them, <coughs> radios, spare stuff that you have to bring so that you can, in case you have to dress up for particular calls. Uh, and lots of times we have spare personnel that, you know, we don't have lockers for everybody at every place. Uh, the Tufts, uh, I'm sorry, let me go back to the Beth Israel Deaconess. They built a very nice facility for us back in the, geez, the 90s. Uh, two bay facility, an ALS and BLS unit there, uh, with an office space above and, uh, uh, you know, adequate space yeah. up there, locker rooms, That's shower. Good to know. Yep. Yeah, and but uh, there's no, there's no charges there. Yeah, so you just mentioned earlier about, um, you know, your staffing levels that you haven't really um, recovered to getting to back to the staffing levels that you would have been uh, in 2019. So yep. we're looking at, we're seeing this pattern across city departments that when we look at staffing levels, um, the impacts of the Great Recession in 20, 2008, 2009, mm -hmm. we were just starting to recover 10 years later and then COVID hit. So. Uh, I think that's something to to bear in mind when we look at, uh, you know, the this, the workload in in departments uh, all across the city. Your department, especially, when you're talking about adding an additional 24 positions, mm -hmm. and then also I want to echo my colleague uh, Councillor Flaherty's uh, advocacy and concern about you know the 911 concern, um, call centre dispatchers. Uh, you know, we understand that they're under extreme pressure and added, added shifts and a lot of um, overtime because they they're not, don't have adequate staffing levels either. So I think those are all areas that are of great concern. Um, let's see, response times. Um, yeah, I think, Madam Chair, um, oh, yeah, yes, the, uh, the best clinicians. The EMS, uh, EMS is proposing to have four additional best positions, is that correct? Uh, and the, uh, not additional, it's a new, a new, new program. Mm -hmm. And then the BPD, uh, Boston Police Department has, has best clinicians that have been in the field now for about a year. Um, it would be really interesting, perhaps, I don't know if you've considered this, to really look at some comparative analysis of outcomes and the sort of calls that get referred to police department versus EM, EMS going forward. It's just to see, is there any qualitative difference in, in, in the interaction with, uh, with, an, with a, a police officer versus an EMS and what the outcomes might be? It's just, I'm just curious. I'm anticipating that there may be a difference, maybe not, but that's something I was wondering if you'd thought about. Well, I mean, uh, look, doing uh, our recording data and doing evaluation on it is obviously going to be very important uh, for, for outcomes, whether it's uh, just number of encounters, patients, patient satisfaction, you know, client satisfaction. Yeah. Are people uh, happy with it? Do people wind up still wind up having to go to an emergency room, or can they be seen somewhere else safely, efficiently, yeah. and get their services there? Which is a cheaper delivery model than going yeah. to an emergency room? Because yeah. unfortunately, a lot of the people that we wind up uh, right now, uh, we go, we the regulations are that you go to a licensed emergency room, yeah. right? and uh, if you can't parse out who may be able to be referred somewhere else, sometimes those folks may in a very, the, the emergency rooms are all overtaxed. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and some people may sit there for several hours, some may just get up and leave, and then 
so they wind up not getting to a point of care, or they wind up uh, back home and then calling somebody else calls them uh, a day or two later, and we yeah. kind of repeat the thing. Yeah. So uh, part of this would be one to try to really manage uh, people who, uh, again, who aren't in such an acute crisis. Some people are stuck. We're never going to prevent everyone from going to an emergency yeah. room, whether it's a behavioral or psychiatric emergency. Some people, uh, they have they could have uh, uh, confounding medical conditions going on. They could have ingestions. They could have anything else yeah. going on. Too. So we have to make sure that they're Getting safe the, and healthy. Getting appropriate care, yeah. Uh, as far as us, uh, we're, I, I would love to get four bus connections, but but I, but I just wanted to be clear. Like what we we're asking for the uh, uh, for the four additional. EMTs, BL, uh, uniform personnel for us, is to support this pilot. When we came to this group, uh, uh, to the council a few years ago, well, before we did it, we were asked by uh, uh, the mayor's office a few years ago to, uh, to try to come up with a non-response unit to help with the unknowns, the man downs, some of the calls that we used to get, a lot of times even out here or downtown. Uh, because those were tying up EMS, uh, an, unknown, an unknown EMS, uh, uh, because we don't have much information at all, that gets police, fire, EMS. And if we go out there and it turns out with somebody who's got maybe some chronic behavioral disorder or somebody who's living in an ATM who now, now we have to spend some time trying to sort that out. If you had an ambulance standing by and sitting at that for a long time, that ambulance isn't available for another priority another response. We started the squad 80, which is just its call sign, and this, this CAT team, two EMTs and an SUV, uh, to try to hit some of those calls, to take some of that off to relief so the crews could become available. Yeah. Some of that was resource management. Then as the situation grew with the uh, um, opioid crisis, and a lot of stuff got concentrated with some of the things that we were dealing with up in the mass cast corridor in the area. Uh, we devoted that unit much more to that area. Initially, that was five days a week. It was a demonstration uh, just on the day shift. And we did that by assigning on-hand personnel. When the concept proved it was helping us and it was helping the personnel, and they could actually interact with some of the outreach people, uh, we wanted to uh, to expand it to seven days a week, and then there was a request to expand it to the evening hours. And the only way we were able to do that was to bring more people, because we because we had to take them out of ambulances to do it, and we were hurting for people staffing yeah. the ambulance. Yeah. So what we did was that's when we came back. Uh, if, we asked for four people one year, four people another year, mm -hmm. to keep building that out. So we anticipated that need uh, to even just to start this on a pilot for a seven days a week on days, we expect we're going to need four people to do it. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chief Foley, and thanks for all your work, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Braden. Councillor Lujan, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you to everyone, panelists today, for all of your incredible work, Chief Hooley, to everyone. I'm sorry I was late, so I didn't catch everyone's name. Um, but, you know, especially during this pandemic, you have borne an incredible weight, um, and so I salute you. I was boosted over, I know EMS did incredible work at IFC in Mattapan Square and making sure, you know, there was a lack of, there was a lack of vaccinations and you guys stepped into that gap and I was boosted at IFC by an EMS nurse um, who I now run into all the time and it brings me so much joy. So thank you for all of your work. Um, because I was late, I don't know who I should address my questions to on um, right in the Office of Recovery Services. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if it's you, Dr. Jacotu, it's I'm going to continue on a formal, <laughs> familiar line that I was going on earlier today. Um, and recovery services, obviously, is you know very important. I know there are folks, I think Councilor Murphy mentioned here um, from Phoenix who, who do really great work. I think Maddie and, and uh, Sydney are here. Um, my question is, is about returning citizens and about how recovery services overlaps and partners with returning citizens, also returning citizens. Not all of our returning c citizens and formerly incarcerated folks are you know, in need of recovery services, but a, a, a good amount are. And so how is that partner, what does that partnership look like? We know that we have a lot of folks coming, transitioning uh, back home um, who there's often a gap in the provision of healthcare and because of a number of barriers, including access to IDs, um, 
there is gap in services. So how do we work both Office of Recovery Services with Office of Returning Citizens to help meet those needs and also more generally with the health care concerns um, that our returning citizens have? So we definitely work with the Office of Recovering uh, Recur Returning Citizens. We do help people um, get their papers, because um, obviously that's important for them to go forward. And you mean do Mass Health? Uh, no, no, I'm talking about like ID, okay. that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. all of that, you know, we, we do uh, work BPHC with BPHC helps with yes, that? Yes, we, we, we work with, um, we have people who actually come to the engagement center and work with um, folks who are coming who are coming out of uh, jail or prison, and mm -hmm. we help them uh, and assist them with the process. I think that we do need that's to do to more. Know. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think we need to do more, mm -hmm. and I think that's also part of our ongoing plan that we should be doing more. And we did collect data on who was actually who had been incarcerated, who had been in prison in the last couple of years when we collected data at the time which we did the encampment um, survey, mm -hmm. and we have been reaching out to them because some of them have been in low threshold housing. So so we'll get some more follow-up and um, report back to you. Thank you. Who are Who is coming to the engagement center? Like what group or entity is coming to do that let, ID work? Let me find that. Okay, because I mean that's an area that my office has been working on quite a bit mm -hmm. in, co in partnership with the coalition of formerly incarcerated folks who talk about the barriers mm -hmm. that accessing ID has on health care, on employment, on housing. housing, on a number of issues. Exactly. So that would be really great to... Mm -hmm. Because I don't, I don't like recreating the wheel if we have somewhere mm -hmm. a system that's that's addressing that gap. The other I'd thing like I to would, build upon that. The other thing I just want to add is that with some of our low threshold housing initiative, we actually don't require paperwork. So we're we're actually putting people into services without a lot of that. Though we were getting them set up for permanent housing, so that was part of the pathway. And I think that's one of the things that we're doing to increase access. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'd love to love mm -hmm. to learn more and talk to you about this. I, I think you know the the There's a theme um, to some of my questions. Mm -hmm. um, and Chief Hula, I, you know, you mentioned the United Coalition of EMS Providers and the work that Roger Hamlet has been doing, which I think is really great. Um, you know, and I like the fact that you know I appreciate the, the acknowledgement of that. There's a lot more work to do. There seems to be a pretty big gap. Um, or drop off in diversity between EMTs, which is you know 33% diverse compared to paramedics, which mm -hmm. seems a much lower. I'm not. I think maybe around 15%. What explains that difference, and, and, and what are we doing to increase the diversity numbers among our paramedics? When we well, well, first off, when we well, we recognize that, and we in, we include that in our uh, remarks that you know, we're. We're keenly aware of it. You know, we when I put that up uh, on the first slide, so we did. We we acknowledge it. We know that uh, it's something that we've been uh, seeking to address for a while. When we give uh, promotional examinations or when we uh, hire for uh, not hire, paramedic is a is an internal posting, right? We we advance people who already work here, and we will advance people who have paramedic certification. So we, a couple of different things we try to do is similar to uh, for recruiting and bringing in people is uh, we, we have people who hold paramedic certification even if they're not uh, currently working for us as medics. Uh, you know, we, we do open up our uh, uh, refresher classes, other classes, and other training, so that they can at least uh, get get some maintain their certification. A few things. So when occasions come along that we do offer promotional exams, uh, hopefully they'll they will be able to keep their uh, certification in good order and be ready to apply for it. Second, we know that the uh, the biggest hurdle is to get the uh, paramedic certification. Well, some of the paramedic training programs. Uh, that were available out there can get costly. Uh, f a few years ago, uh, Northeasterns was in the 20,000 plus uh, to, to do it. Uh, other places uh, a little bit uh, uh, less expensive or maybe half that price. And they also uh, take a fair amount of uh, time and, uh, and commitment to do that. It's a lot more uh, uh, lengthy than the EMT uh, program. However, having said that, a lot of people do uh, consistently uh, do uh, complete it and and obtain the certification. What we need is to uh, get more employees here from uh, various uh, race, ethnicity certified. Uh, one of the 
big, biggest enhancement we did. We did a few years ago. We did partner with uh, the uh, SkillWorks grant, uh, and we uh, offered, uh, we were able to get, we did, Northeastern had a, was running a program at the time, uh, which was on the expensive side. However, with the uh, SkillWorks grant, we were able to obtain basically half price scholarships, which opened up to uh, any department member who was able to get into that program. And we did pursue that until that went away. Uh, that was somewhat successful in helping to get some people into the system and to, uh, to advance. Uh, however, not enough so that we have a good pool of candidates mm -hmm. when we give the promotional exam for uh, paramedic promotions. With uh, uh, USIP's help, uh, they've been able to go out and generate funding for scholarships, funding for a few other things to really help persons to do that. And the scholarships would help with the, with the process of taking the exam? To, to, to taking the uh, class to become uh, certified, to become a paramedic. Mm -hmm. So how, uh, much, how much are those classes? What's about Gil? About $12,000 right now for, yeah. For and how long do you have to, is it like a year long program? Two years? Two. I think it's about two. Mm -hmm. Two. Yeah, we, I'm sorry, uh, Deputy Superintendent Alexander has been, uh, she's mm -hmm. a, a member of the board of USEP. No she's way. also been uh, uh, helping us to uh, uh, steer a lot of our, our members that way. So it's a great opportunity to do it. We have uh, about 10 people who are currently uh, in, in in that program now who are able to, who are getting the benefit of the you know, free education. I mean, they're putting in the study and the sweat equity and getting it done and, you know, traveling uh, you know, over to the Charlestown campus. Uh, what we're trying to do that with, well, though, to make it easier is, like, we'll provide their clinical opportunities at, at our site, uh, unlike some other programs where, like, back in the day with Northeastern, if you had taken their program, uh, they would place you doing a, a rotation down in New York City. So you go down with New York EMS, and then you'd be responsible for you know, staying down there for a time. Uh, but in this case, so like our members who are going there, or even our members, if they go into another program here, up, 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 up here, uh, attending a, a program that is uh, uh, you know, a certified program, approved program, and, they're, and uh, a good program that they're in, Lots of times we will let them uh, do uh, some of their clinical rounds and internship here, which one, saves them time and potentially saves them uh, money. Uh, we, we've looked at other programs before with trying to enhance people getting their paramedic certification uh, with some other programs where they would uh, uh, where they would get a discount for our members if we had a couple, either A, based on volume of people going to it, or uh, if we were able to provide uh, that internship with us, mm -hmm. which is, uh, because we, we, one, we provide a good internship, but also we're able to, uh, uh, that takes some cost off those programs. So we're, we're trying to look at different ways to, uh, to enhance the pool of paramedics here. Okay, thank you. Uh, my clock, the clock went off, so I'll, I'll, Madam Chair, I'll wait for a second round to ask my additional questions. Uh, you can go ahead. Oh, go ahead, okay. We're gonna wrap uh, up early. Okay. Great. So, I mean, uh, I'm thinking, and I'm, and I apologize if you've mentioned this, but working with Madison Park or with school, with our schools, I, you know, and I'm partnering with that both like as a pipeline issue, but also to address the issue of structural racism within our healthcare system. So, I'm a lawyer. One of the only places where I like announce very loudly that I'm a lawyer, especially when I'm with family members, is in hospital and healthcare settings because of um, the disparate treatment, oftentimes that. Um, black and brown folks face in the healthcare setting. And I was thinking that, are there programs, or, or what are the programs, I, I'll, I'll make it more broadly, um, that um, EMS is doing in partnership, perhaps with BPS or perhaps with Madison Park, to not only introduce um, our young students to a potential career in EMS, um, but also to um, help navigate some of the bias that exists within our healthcare system, oftentimes because um, EMS can be and often is the first point of contact for folks suffering 
um, from a healthcare emergency. Um, and I guess the second part of my question actually it doesn't have to do with BPS, but more sort of what is EMS doing internally to deal with issues of bias that present itself in the provision of health care to, to our Boston residents, um, especially from black and brown communities. So just to restate one, the first is about BPS, and the second is about, um, um, is about you know, addressing issues of bias and structural racism within EMS and the provision of health care. Okay, um, if, if it's okay, maybe I'll just- Yeah, just, however you want to answer. Yeah, no, I'll flip the order because I mean, you-, you uh, Go right at it. You, you kind of hit to the heart of it. I think we have, to, uh, we, have, we have to address it in ourselves first, right? We have to address it in the individuals and in our organization and our society, uh, even if we're gonna go out and say partner with BPS or anybody else. But, uh, so, to, to, so, you know, to that end, one is uh, uh, the whole, uh, recognizing that there is a, a problem, as you stated, uh, and not in healthcare, but in society in general, and housing, and you name it, uh, education. But, but you know, specifically in healthcare, where we do, we do play a role that we know, that we realize, and uh, you know, we acknowledge that uh, if even uh, you know, great facilities like Mass General, Brigham, Beth Israel, all these hospitals with uh, uh, well-trained physicians can uh, uh, recognize that there's disparities in care and in outcomes, and whether it's uh, pain management, whether it's, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if rates of certain diseases are, uh, may be lower in, uh, in, say, in an African-American community, but the fatality rate of it's higher. Right? Uh, what, why is that? Why, you know, like, again, does, uh, does an EMT or a paramedic have to uh, figure that out from the time we're in? So then I won't call one call, maybe not, but, but to be able to, one, appreciate that, to know that we're all part of this system, to know that we're all uh, affected by this, that we know that uh, patients that we're encountering, whether it's uh, uh, kids with asthma, our, our rates higher in a certain way. Our, our, our outcomes are potentially going to be worse. Should we have a higher index of suspicion or, or a threshold of how we're going to care? Uh, you know, just, just one quick, you know, anecdotal thing. That, you know, several years ago, uh, we had a uh, a 16-year-old that from from Dorchester, an asthmatic, who was was, was really bad, and uh, he wound up uh, arresting. We went into cardiac arrest while we, while we were caring for him. We transported him in. Obviously, it was devastating for the family, for anybody who knew him, but it was pretty devastating for our crew as well. And uh, we were trying to look at this and like say, wow, is this you know, something that either we missed or whatever. But you know, one of the things we, we saw was that when we looked back, that we had encountered this one patient, uh, and I've, it's been a couple of years now for, for me to remember this, and I, uh, uh, a couple of times mm -hmm. in a in a year, say right. But the last couple of times you saw him, there was less period intervening in between where we encountered him. And uh, looking at the charts, uh, he was sicker each time. Now, was there something predictive there? Maybe, but but what do we do with that? Are we are we mm -hmm. so are we sitting on maybe some knowledge, some different things that that we could use that we could share? Like, so do we? What do we do with that for for any uh 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 uh, uh, say young person with asthma for a certain age and uh, to, uh, to try to pass on to and we started doing before doing referrals to environmental health and public health to say like hey under a certain age is it, is it issues more with uh, access to care or is it more like environmental things like where they live or what's mm -hmm. around or is there uh, some kind of a transfer station across the street is this something else that's impact to, to start thinking like that uh, and that's one of the reasons why we we wanted to illustrate, use things like that, calls like that, uh, calls like kids falling out windows, where that's happening, and where we're seeing window guards, and uh, that they were learning and working with partners, injury prevention. And we started looking at that a few years ago, but we also wanted to use that to illustrate when we're putting together our training. And, and uh, the, the deputy has been very involved in. You know, the real training the city's talking about doing that real training for, uh, 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 
was uh, diversity uh, of the um, yeah, real equitable action learning. That that's one set of uh, mm -hmm. uh, words that go with that, another one. But uh, what we're trying to do is like we're doing our training, and we're starting it again this cycle uh, for uh, diversity, inclusion, and uh, inequity is to uh, is to uh, try to illustrate cases like that, so that when we're doing our training with our personnel internally to look at structural racism, to look at uh, a lot of different things. We're not just putting up terms in the board. We're, we want them to have that aha moment, see the light, see the connection. Where can we fit in there so that we can, we can start to see? So one, we're trying to improve ourselves internally so that we can hold the mirror up and say, like, say, hey, are we really doing a good job or not? We like to think we are. Yep. Um, so we're, we're doing that training ourselves where we took guidance from, from uh, the initiative from the mayor's office and that, certainly from uh, public health with Trenise's group, and uh, we're rolling our training out from that. Thank you, and do you feel like, and I think um, that- Sorry. Oh. Sorry. Ah. <laughs> sorry, Council Lujan. Um, let's uh, allow Council Baker to go, and then we'll, we can come back to you. Okay. I'll be quick. Council Baker. No. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair, and good afternoon, everybody. Jim, nice to see you. Chief, nice to see you, and that was, um, that was a nice ceremony yesterday. I noticed was more than half the class women. It it you, looked you got me. It was pretty like good. We, we've at had, least half we, the class. Were we've had some good. classes that were just like 50 50, and some that were even just a little bit more. But yeah, we've had some pretty good success uh, uh, getting more more women. Yeah, to I thought us. I thought that that was interesting. Um, so the squad 80 car, that's basically down on Mass and Cass. Does that travel around at all? It is. I mean, we'll use it. I mean, we, because sometimes we'll get similar type calls at Copley or a few other places, but we've been, only because of the demands up in that area, it's... And is that like an overdose car? Is that, do you respond to overdoses or no, a distressed no. person or something no, that no, might not be need any, an ambulance? It, it, could be, it could be anything up there because we do get, and we get people, uh, we could get a pedestrian struck or it could be somebody gets clipped by a car mirror or we could get... Uh, somebody who's a uh, uh, question of an EDP up around there, they go with the police. Uh, but, but, but they do respond to a lot of overdose, the report of unconscious. Uh, but they also go out and uh, they keep an eye out for like either new encampments hopping up. Because one of the things when we, uh, when we displace people, whatever, if we're, I mean, that's not the right word, but if an engagement set of closes or if the, if the state police gonna crack down on the connector, the folks go somewhere else. So we want to, so what Squad 80, if they notice, hey, a tent's going up on uh, Jim Rice Field, or, or if they notice stuff going up at uh, Orchard Park, they'll, they, they report it back. Yeah, and is that where, is that where the, um, the best team is? Are they gonna be with the Squad 80, or are they gonna be, like, how is that, how is best gonna connect on to EMS, you know, like, Previous iterations, we had talked about some sort of center down on Mass and Cass where we could have a, a united kind of a response. Police could be in there, EMS could be in there, public work could be in there. That's obviously not going to happen now. So, how does how do you foresee best connecting on like because you get an EMS call, you're out the door. Are they like best we need you? We'll see you there, or are they going to be? coming from the same spot? How, how does that, how's that gonna work? Oh, okay. Well, the way on the, uh, uh, so, so with the best, so, so, so again, we're, we're, we're kind of hoping to do is, uh, you know, first, if it's, if it's a call in to 911, trying to triage to see like, do we even have to go? Or is this something that can be uh, transferred into a clinician who can talk with them, set up something, make an appointment? Because they go out to people independent now. With that the best we, team, the best. Do. We found that out. And, uh, well, and how do they get a call? They get a, they get a ref because yeah, they, they actually. They have a, believe it or not, they have a call center. And, uh, but they don't. So you know, 311? It's not a 311, but I, I actually, I should know the number. But, uh, but I think the hospital, they, I don't know, I don't know how they advertise it, but it's not like, you know, 911 painted on the side of an ambulance yeah. or a police car. So it's, but we would have a connection to them. It would be, a, it actually, the connection already exists. It would be like a one button transfer. We bring them in to, to conference with them uh, once that could go live. We did that for a little bit during COVID when we got uh, 
when there was a state of emergency, we had authorization to, uh, on really low acuity calls, uh, we were getting calls for people with maybe some dental things or needed a prescription refill, but they couldn't get to it. Or the doctors weren't seeing patients. Remember back in April? So were you they, guys doing stuff like that? People, well, we did it with, uh, we, we used attendings uh, that from, um, from Boston Medical Center docs, emergency docs that we had uh, available and we tried it. We did it for like, we didn't do it for 24 hours a day. We couldn't sustain that. But we did it for a while where, you know, someone would call with maybe they thought an abscess, this was sort of dental thing. So instead of going to an emergency room, they would set up an appointment for them at BU School of Medicine, uh, School of Dentistry. They could phone in a prescription if mm. need be. And uh, the state at that time approved it under, under an emergency waiver, which has since expired. But, but so similarly, we could do that for a little bit on the phone. As far as the best team, if we had a best member a clinician with us, it could come in through a, uh, a 911 call. It could come from one of our crews on scene. Uh, ambulance 11, they, they go but for But does call. best get themselves there? Yeah, well, they're on bikes well, and that, stuff. But, but no, we, no, no the, uh, the best person, we would like to put them in a, in a vehicle with us, like in an SUV, similar to squad. So eight. then that, that one, that yes. one ambulance or squad car would be responsible for all those calls citywide. If you had the best clinician with you. Right. So, but we would also have the ability to talk to them on the phone or talk to the clinician on the phone. So if, if it was a case where we could get some advice or, and hopefully if the police are able to retain having the best clinicians out there, but well, we could share them as a resource as well. Uh, because I mean, right now, I mean, we do calls with the BPD best teams on scene and, uh, you know, they, we, they do section 12s and section 35s with them. The other day, I was out. We were doing a uh, when they were doing the street cleanup. Where we do meet with DPW, and they do a quick huddle every morning, and they work with the uh, uh, needle teams to make sure. There's a whole choreographed thing how they clean the streets every morning, mm -hmm. and uh, you know we have somebody who's involved in uh, the planning for that. They weren't available one morning. Actually, I stopped by to to visit it, and uh, but our squad 80 was involved with the BPD and their best unit. Uh, for uh, Section 35, where they had somebody there uh, who was that a judge had agreed had to really go away somewhere for uh, a bit of long for their own good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm a yeah. fan of Section 35. Okay. Um, I don't know a fan, but I think it no, should no, be. No, I think it should yeah. be used. I think it's yeah, something like we were told all options are on the table, but the Section 35 and the Section 12 option doesn't really seem like it's on the table, which is why I think we have the open air drug market and the open prostitution and just everything happening right on the street on, on Mass and Cass, whether it's Albany Street, whether it's Topeka Street or Bradson Street. I, I think it's because we've, well, I don't even want to go down that rabbit hole with you, but I appreciate, I appreciate it. I want to ask some questions about the roundhouse. Now, doctor, I think these will probably be yours. I thought that doctor, um, Burrell would be here, but I guess not. We don't seem to rate these days. Uh, how many people were on the street when we started clearing them? What was the actual number down there when we were clearing the? When we were clearing the tents? Yeah, in January. So it was a little over 145. 145. How many of those people went to the roundhouse? So 60. 60. Are those same 60 people still in there? There's been some turnover. Um, we're coming up with a report, which you should be, you should yeah. have next week. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so some people have moved forward and have we backfilled because a concern that I had, and I don't know if it's uh, founded or not that, and it seems like there's more people down on the street now than there were since we've been dealing with this. Let so, me just finish and you can, sure, you can answer sure. to that. Um, like it looks like they're down there now because they think we're handing out rooms. Is that, I mean, how does somebody come down here and then like are we, okay, only the, only the 60 people were allowed in there and we're not letting any more in there? Are we gonna continue to backfill that with just whoever shows up on our door? So I, I guess I just back up for one second and just talk about the numbers because we've yep. been tracking the numbers down there. It's probably a, about, in terms of actual people, 
the same numbers. What's gone are the tents, the structures, right? So I think that was a big thing though, because that is what leads to um, a lot of problems, right? It, the public health issues, the um, infection control, the different things that are happening there in those, the violence, the, you know, what we have down there is a situation where you do have a lot of people who are on the streets and some of them are, you know, living on the streets. A lot of them are from the shelter. They come out of the shelter. They don't have the back area, the courtyard that I discussed that we're creating. They don't have a place to, to spend the day and they end up, you know, kind of sitting and aggregating on the street. So that has been an ongoing issue. And that's part of the, the winter, or the, excuse me, the summer plan, the warm weather plan that we're coming up with that you will hear about more from Dr. Burrell next week. Um, in terms of the roundhouse, I think that there was a, a waiting list, you know, people who were in the encampments who, you know, were going to then be put into low threshold. But I think the bigger part of the story, and I, I guess the more the successful part of the story, is that a number of those people have been put into permanent housing, a, lot, a number of them have been put into treatment, a number have been put on medication for opioid use disorder. So that's a good thing. And will we have all those numbers? That's the goal. That's what I'm understanding is the goal for next week. Yeah. Um, it, it, because it, under new initiatives number six, it says you're looking to expand the net the network of daytime low threshold. Yes. Like where is that going to happen? And, 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 and to get back to Roundhouse, mm -hmm. get back to Roundhouse. When it was first floated to us, it was a six month thing, and then when we started looking at the MOU, mm -hmm. it was a one year extension, a two year extension, then then an option to buy. Mm -hmm. That to me. There hasn't been one mention of an end date on that. So that tells me that the, the talk around, um, um, you know, decentralizing services it, it is all that, just talk, because that's, that's, a, that's a lot of heavy use there. That's, that's using in their rooms. That's everything that happens on the street, I would have to think, is going on behind closed doors now, just behind closed doors. We can't see it. Mm -hmm. That's all going to continue to happen there. Like, I'm concerned that public health or, or BMC is going to try and buy this place and keep it running and operating the way it is. Because I, I, don't, I don't feel like we've been really paid. I, I'll speak for myself, I've been paid attention at all in this, in this whole conversation. Just the fact that it was started at six months and then there's an option to buy there. For, like, so what is the change of use there at the Roundhouse that was, the, that was granted by ISD that was a, a, a temporary because it wasn't a, an emergency? Mm -hmm. That's 180 days. That ends in May, I think. Mm -hmm. What happens after that? Mm -hmm. Like, do, do, is, is BMC or public health gonna come to the community like if I wanted to do a deck on my house and needed a zoning change, I would have to go to the community. Is BMC or public health gonna come to the community and say, we want a change of use on this here now, we're going to zoning and we're doing the process now. Like, so what is, what is the, it, it was a lodging house, now what is it? And are you gonna come in front of the community and ask to, to, to make that permanent? So what I would say is that Number one, decentralization is the focal point of this plan. The long term, even the midterm, is about moving people out of that area. I think there are too many people, the crowding is dangerous. We're aware of that, and as you've expressed, that isn't in the best interest of the city of Boston. The details of that, I'm gonna leave to you, know, you getting a chance to read the plan and discussing it and ongoing community engagement and talking to you about, and as well as the other counselors about what it is that you know, we think might make most sense. I don't think that, I guess I'll say, I think that a lot of the work that we're doing there is trying to save lives, as, as you well know, and I think we're all very concerned about the situation. We're concerned about people who are living down there, who are spending their days down there. We're concerned about the uptick in, in violence. We're trying to make this um, a workable situation, meaning that we do have to find some alternate day spaces where those will be located are not known yet. So that's very clear to me and I'm telling you, you know, exactly, it's, it's not known. We do have um, an RFP out there to see if anybody would be willing to have much smaller day spaces than say the engagement center. Is that the way this is gonna go? 
you know, hopefully, you know, we, it, that would give people other places to go during the day because we know that that is what um, people need. They need access to services. So all of these places or any of these places that um, are part of this plan, as you see, will be service centers. There'll be places where people can get harm reduction, people can get clinical care, people can get their medications, people get actually get access to things as opposed to necessarily there being places where, you know, people are just, um, just engaging throughout the day and, and you know aggregating so creating a similar situation to what we've seen on Southampton and, 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 and to make a point I just think that we are 100 percent focused on harm reduction or just harm reduction just harm reduction and I don't think there's I don't think there's nearly enough talk when it comes to intervention section 35 section 12 so we have again back to all this oppa money we have oppa money have we have we have we built any beds that can be detox beds? Have we, I mean, we're building housing, low threshold housing. Like, when you guys are 10, 15 years in this career, you'll, you're gonna have a laundry list of people like this that you've been trying to get housing to. But yet, like, Brandon can come up from, from Situate, he's been a nuisance in, in every neighborhood he's been in for the last five years. He's been here shitting on people's steps, shooting up, no problem, you know, a thief, but yet we're going to give him a housing without even any paperwork. And we've got people on housing lists for years that, 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 that can't get in housing. But we're going to totally focus on and allow people to continue to do drugs while they're in the apartments, while they're in these low threshold places. There's no talk of, okay, you've got to get off that at some point. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't seem like there is any to me. And, 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 and I've dropped a lot of people off at detox. I've section 35 family members. The most, one of the most difficult things that I've, that I've had to do. I've revived people before Narcan. Mm -hmm. You know, I've seen people go to jail and come back sober because they went to jail, because they're unable to get what they need to stay high, to not be sick, because it's about not being sick. And how do we think that low threshold housing in the middle of the Wild West, when you're, even if you do have five days, 10 days, 30 days sober, your first step is going to be on mass and cast. Mm -hmm. All the drug dealers are all over you. And my last point I'm going to make, um, we said the police are involved in this. I've heard stories of, of public health people, nurses, being openly hostile to the police. We don't need you here. We don't want you here. You're not part of this solution. Um, you don't need to answer that. That's just what I've heard. Mm -hmm. And, and it isn't it, it, to say that we're working together and all options are on the table. Let's really put all options on the table. Let's talk about Section 35s. Let's figure out where we can do something in Boston, Section 35s, Section 12s. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think we're leaving a lot on the table. When we cleared the tents, the people that stayed there, we wouldn't have got them out of there with a crowbar because that's where they want to be because that's where their life is. That's where it's easy for them. We're calling them comfort stations. They should be made uncomfortable. It's gonna be uncomfortable here. It shouldn't be comfortable. Because the more comfortable you are, you don't have to make any life changes. And to me, it looks like long, slow suicide for all of them that are down there. And I'll end on that. I hope I was respectful to you. I'm trying to be. No, you were respectful. I just think that maybe we disagree on some things and maybe we can come to some agreement. Part of what we're doing here is harm reduction. But part of what we're doing is also exposing people and ha educating people about recovery and treatment. Within the last fiscal year, the Recovery Service Bureau referred more than 1,800 people to treatment. Now, referred them to treatment? Yes, so I'm, I'm, let, me, let me finish, let me finish, okay. <laughs> and in addition to referring people to treatment, as I said, we do hundreds of referrals and starts on medication for opioid use disorder. And I'm gonna get you the numbers, and Dr. Burrell will get you the numbers, in terms of the actual placements in permanent housing, along with the number of people who are actually on medication for opioid use disorder, who've been in the roundhouse, as well as Envision, and the other uh, low threshold sites. So I think that you will have this information, you'll see that these sorts of things, they do work for people. And the evidence base is there, that low, health, low threshold housing, having a place to sleep, having a safe place to be is a critical piece of recovery, as is actually explaining to people that harm reduction is important and giving them access to clean needles and access to prevention for you know HIV and other things. I so don't disagree. I don't disagree that harm reduction is important. I, I, I know it's important, but I think when that's our only game we have 
and that's the only thing we're, we're gonna do. And of course, you can show me numbers that are gonna be favorable to you. It seems like since we've been this last however many years, 10, 15 years, when it's all harm reduction, what was it? What was there? A hundred thousand or two hundred thousand opioid deaths in 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 the country last year, going through the roof. That's an epidemic. We're not talking about that, and it's and that coincides with with taking trying to get people off this drug and get them on an FDA approved drug. And again, I see and I know that I know I'm sorry. No, I no, see the value that. in it. I know the value in it, but mm -hmm. I just think we're going about it the wrong way and putting people in housing without that carrot and stick approach. Can you be sober for a little while? Then we'll give you keys to a house. You Council, know what I'm saying? I just, Council Baker, I, yeah. I'm really interested in Dr. Ojukutu finishing yeah. her, the point. Um, I, was, I was listening in and I really wanted to listen to the rest of that. Right, well essentially what I was saying was that you know, we have a very strong evidence base stating that housing is an important first step for people on their path to recovery. Otherwise, we wouldn't have established low threshold housing. We are evidence-based, data-driven folks, you know, that we see people out on the street and we know that we're giving them, you know, syringe um, services and we're doing harm reduction. We realize that living on the street, that's not a path to recovery for the vast majority of people. Therefore, we made this significant investment as a city because we think that it works. And I, I'm certain that the numbers that you will see, and they're not, I don't think you can twist num numbers to that extent. They're not in anyone's favor. They're the actual numbers of people who have left those places, gone to permanent housing, those people have gone into treatment, those people who are on medication for opioid use disorder, and those people who are lost to follow up. Because this is complicated. And there are lots of people who are not going to do well necessarily. And I think we need to realize that too. I think overall, this is a very difficult situation and we're doing all the collaboration that I believe is necessary to make it work. And I think it's going to, I think we're gonna look back in a couple years when we've spent, you know, probably a couple hundred million per year on this housing people that, that I think they need something more than, I think they need to, I think they need some healing before they get into housing. Maybe it should be group housing first. I don't know, I, I, have, I have a group that's at my playground in my neighborhood, there's five of them. Every one of them has a section eight to go in someplace, but yet they, they choose to use that playground, the only place in the neighborhood for little kids to go, they choose to use that to shoot up in and use as their bathroom. All of them have section eights, all of them have some place to go, but they choose to stay right there because there's no rules. So you and I disagree. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think there's somewhere in the middle there that I think sure. we should we should be working on. But I see this as I see this as a money pit. It, it, in and we're just starting on it now. We're just starting. Well, How just much say, have we spent me, in APA money let me, this let me year? Just, let me just say one additional thing because I think it's really important, Councillor Baker, because I think all of us want to know how much money we're spending, what's the most effective pathway, what makes most sense. So we're actually evaluating these, the number of people, the total number of people who've been place into all these different settings because it's not just roundhouse. You know that they're pallets, you know that they're congregate settings, 112 and Willows, the same group home type situation that you described. So we're going to follow these people out and actually see who does better. It may be that it's more efficient, more effective, more um, you know cost effective to look at group homes. Otherwise, it might be that, that some of these hotel settings are the best place for a certain type of individual. So I think we have to get the information, understand it, see what works best for people, and also realize that this is just complicated. Addiction is just comp. I don't think there's one answer. Addiction is complicated. But if you're going to look you, at Council return Bader. on investment, a hundred, if, if, if there's a, not even a thousand people out Thank there, you, we're going to spend a hundred million dollars on them. Thank you, Council Baker. Thank you. That's, you're fine. Um, I think we all got some extra time today. Um, I appreciate your advocacy. I hear your passion. Um, I think uh, the question that I have is, you know, really understanding, and we'll start, we'll just sort of segue um, into that, what Council, Baker, Council Baker's points. Um, do we know how long, um, I mean, just for the record, obviously, um, do we know how long Mass and Cass has been in existence? That's a good question. Can I speak to that? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Council Baker. Um, she yes. Totally yes. The, the tents arrived in April last year. They all happened at the same time. 
It was a coordinated event. I think they weren't there before, and we always had people there for years. It got worse during the that the opioid crisis last ten years, but the tents all showed up on Mass and Cass over a weekend last year, and then it just grew because it was about housing first. About a year. About a year. Okay. The tents. There were there were encampments in different spots, but you had to look for them. You had to find them. You had to know where they were. Yeah. Do we, we know? Better Please. No. If I may. <laughs> I don't mean a better answer. No, I, mean, I, mean, I apologize. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. An answer plus. Just what is to, the answer? Just so you understand that the, the full history of it, Councillor, is that when the bridge did go down, the Long Island Bridge, 2014, that was where our, our main homeless shelter was on Long Island. When the bridge closed, uh, we've always had Woods Mullen, but Within a year or so, we opened up 112 Southampton, uh, and that's when a lot of the, the services came down to that particular area. So that's been since essentially 2014 uh, that it's been. Uh, Prior to 2014, can you tell me what services for recovery we implemented for that population? I mean, we, it was similar to what we have now. We've always had our Homeless Services Bureau, our Recovery Services. Uh, Woods Mullen was in that area. Uh, one, the, the, the other shelter and the other uh, recovery services were on Long Island, but uh, those, those programs have been in existence essentially since Do you know what programs? I don't know specifically off the top of my head. So, you know. um, so we know that... Transitions. On the Mattapan campus, so there was. Yeah, but they they were out there for. A while. They were on Long Island too. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There were some level of wraparound services, right? We had uh, community supports um, program through Mass Health, mm -hmm. CSP. We had. They could do outpatient, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They could have an outreach worker. Mm -hmm. They could have a street worker, mm -hmm. or they could have a case manager. If whether it was through housing, Woods Mullen Clinic, or the shelter. Mm -hmm. So those are the services that we worked, we had. Mm -hmm. And at that point, after we closed Long Island, what happened? We started, there was an increase of, let's go through the timeline. Like, right. like there was so, an increase on, on Mass and Cass. So Councilor, Councilor Anderson, I think it would be helpful to have a, a really thought through, well thought through timeline. I was just t texting with some of my colleagues who've been around much longer than I have, and they would like to get back to you with a good timeline. I mean, we could, I could speculate, but I, I really want to tell appreciate you that. Where the, where the programs came, when they came in, I think that would be helpful for all of us. To no problem. Understand. No problem. We can, we can fast forward to last year, April, when the tents came. Okay. And then the tents happened, and then when did the low threshold program begin? So we started working on that after I started in September. Um, we started talking to the state. It was a city-state collaboration. Um, we started making arrangements to get service providers in, and then the decision was made by January 12th to essentially move everybody, you know, who was willing to go, and everybody was willing to take down their tent and go. There were no issues with that to move them into some low threshold setting. I think it's important, though as I was explaining, is that we didn't send everybody to a hotel room. There were different type. There are different types, right? So there's congregates. That's important for us to recognize. There are the pallets. There's a state-funded, um, you know, uh, mechanism for low threshold housing, and people were sent there, you know, in a way that we thought was somewhat systematic. You know, I think I told you we did an equity analysis to see where people were going. And I think overall, what we're trying to find out is what works best, you know, what works for best for people as they sort of on their journey to recovery, hopefully. So that's Along, where we're at. But along with the low trash housing, you did collaborate with BMC to create a plan for services, interventions, or to actually, and you did that through the community. Sure. And how did that go? I think that it was challenging. Um, so Dr. Burrell really led that process and probably would be better place to speak in detail because she went to all the community meetings. You know, I went to f some of them. I think there were lots of challenges, um, lots of concerns about the roundhouse and the existence of the roundhouse, concerns about um, having folks be in low threshold housing in other neighborhoods around the city. Um, and that's been an ongoing 
challenge, but yeah, it so was able to move, we were able to move it forward. I think maybe that's the point, is that we were able to kind of come to some compromise and, and move things forward. And then we're moving forward. Yeah. For 2014, prior to that, I used to work with clients in Long Island. Mm -hmm. And um, I, know, I know that the service, I know I'm very familiar with the services in place up to about that time. Mm -hmm. And what I saw in the last several years with Mass and Cass is this increase, right, of people coming in and nothing happening. Nothing happening pre this administration, pre Dr. Pasola, mm -hmm. pre, doc, pre Dr. Um, Burrell. Burrell. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing happening. Nothing happening. Just outreach, street teams, outreach, street teams. Then it was like, okay, well, they can't go cold. We need tents, right? Heat exhaustion or whatever else. So it was like a temporary, and it was very communicated, you know, well communicated. It was going to be temporary uh, um, situation with the tents. Low threshold housing, as Dr. Bissol is explaining, is really um, evidence based, and it is. It does prove. It's been proven that this is the best, most effective way of people I, I getting treatment. Agree. I understand. Evidence I, don't. I don't agree. <laughs> I know that I have a ton of people that I would love to be able to put into any kind of housing, a, a Why room, are all putting whatever, but on as if can't, we're supposed can't to do it. I just don't agree. But because there isn't any other, Council, there isn't any, where's the other side of Council it? Baker, yeah. Council Baker, I totally get it. I understand that you don't agree. I'm now just stating my point. And I'm saying that... You're stating your point to me. Yeah, Don't well, I see. Well. Yes, you are absolutely right. And you're, yeah, you're welcome to respond, I guess, but I have heard you disagree already. And I'm saying to you, I guess, now, fine, let's do this, fine. No, I'm saying to- the evidence, where's the evidence of, okay, Tanya, can you, can you get sober and we'll put you in a house and see how you do from there and we'll wrap the services around well you're not using, well you're not sticking a needle in your arm. And, you, and there's, there's one point that you, that, that you, you um, and this is my opinion also, so the proliferation of, of methamphetamine happened also. Methamphetamine just strips people of their, their inhibitions, and that's why a lot of them are out on the, on the street. Otherwise, they're not gonna, they're not gonna care so little of themselves than to go and, and, and do what happened on the street last year. To me, all that looked like methamphetamine-induced um, the challenge, the challenge is that the challenge is right there that people don't actually have all the answers, and that different methods have been tried in different countries. But there are evidence-based research that we can talk offline, and that we can look up or get from um, public health to actually show you what you're asking for. There, there's actually research that shows you. You, if you. If you're asking in particularly to mass and CAS, you will have to wait a few years so that before the data comes in, so you can look at how the progress happened. But in terms of research, it's already been done. We don't have a few years. That's gonna, we're gonna have, that's gonna so what do you want to do? Exactly so what do you want to do? If you want, but, but if you want to do the section 12 and the 35, that's a conversation for public safety. Right? Public health is in charge now. If public no, health no. is it <laughs> We need spaces to do it. So they're not they're not public what I'm saying is the police are not in, in the, they say the police are in the conversation, they're not in the conversation. We don't have section thirty five beds to bring them any place. We don't have section twelve beds. We don't have them. No Very few of them. I I think we do. Okay. Then get the data on that and tell me where they are. To start program, all these these programs don't exist anymore. Is that accurate? Well, just to start, BPD is at the table. We have been meeting with them. We have been talking through strategies. We are sort of working on a collaborative approach because this isn't just this shouldn't just be led by public health. This isn't just about public health. This is about public safety. We've been working with many different stakeholders, including EMS, including other folks who've been helping us to deal with this. I don't think that there's one strategy that's going to work. I think many different options are on the table, but I, I don't think we can deviate from the fact that we have to treat people with empathy. We have to treat people as though they have an illness. That is why we're doing the things that we are doing. So yes, public health is leading in terms of the that underlying 
thematic, you know, sort of impetus for doing this, but BPD is right there at the table. We're all talking about how to manage this, this diff very difficult situation. The other point that I'll, thank you so much, Dr. Soul. the other point that I'll make is, like, I get that you, this, this hits home, and you're compassionate, and you have been very respectful, and I appreciate you for that. But the other thing is that we have to understand the language that we use, even when we're just talking about our cousins or our family members. There are people watching, and there are ways of communicating you know, this, this type of thing um, in ways that we're not um, offending people. And so I, I, I try to remind, for me, I tell myself that, I try to remember to come from a strength-based point of view in terms of how we're talking about recovery um, because we can hurt people, you know, in the way that we speak. And this is a very hard uh, disease that we're talking about. Like, I'm always talking about equity, right? And I'm always like, hey, how are we including Nubian Square, the black folks that's been, you know, suffering, and what did we do with the crack epidemic and up to now? I'm always trying to bring that forward and saying, let's make sure that we are doing this with an equitable lens. But st and, st and still, and I come from a generation that, you know, I say, we use terms that we can't just can't say anymore. And so I think that even when it hits home, even when we know that you know this is something we've dealt with, we have to just be mindful in how we talk about it too, because there are people watching and they can be disrespectful. No, not I at all. Terminology that is talk based or on our I'm not sure is that directed towards me, the, the language we use, am I using I think I think, no, 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 I don't think I want to, like, manage how you talk. I, I think I was saying for myself in terms of how we communicate and going back and forth and just being mindful and not getting too emotional about it for me because then I don't want to, like, say anything out of nowhere that offends people, right? So I, I'd rather talk to you offline about this. If you've, done, if you've said anything, I wasn't actually, like, managing how you were talking. Um, I think I did pretty I think you did really good. I think you did really good. Can I, can I just make one point? Okay, one point. <laughs> okay, we had, and you had just mentioned it yourself, all, all options are on the table. What I'm saying is the section 35 to section 12 option isn't on the table. In, in a little, little bit, we talk about the police being involved. So the police have someone that's obviously whacked out on meth, running up and down in the middle of, the, of, of traffic, naked. Right? Mm -hmm. What are they supposed to do? Pick them up and do what with them? Bring them back to the station? Because that's all, bring them back to the station, bring them in front of a judge, and they're out the very, that same day. If we're not sectioning people, or even if we had a, a program that was a Section 35 program, people could self-section themselves. Because I'm sure there's people down there that have had enough mm -hmm. that so would say, I just, want, I just want to clarify my statement. I didn't say all, or if I did, I misspoke. I said most options, we, but we have to lead with empathy and with a public health approach. That's really what I want to end this with because I kind of think we have to, we can continue to have conversations about it. And, it, it, but, it, it yeah. and just because I believe in that we should be using section 35 or section 12 doesn't mean I have empathy. When I, when I, when I section my older sister, I loved her. Well, it sounds, it's, it's, it sounds like, Council Baker, you um, would like to continue to work with Dr. Bisola and uh, looking well, these at... these are our budget hearings, and this is what this is what well, about. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I think, I think that they're on a wrong path, is what I think. I, and this is my budget hearing, this is my time to make my piece known. And I... And I um, it's not to make me angry. Sorry. That's why I'm just... So you... Uh, Councilor Baker, um, you know you're my guy, and um, I will go unconventional anytime to make sure. I'll button it up now. To get, yeah. we have to get comfortable. We have to allow for space for us to be ourselves and communicate in whatever we need to convey. Um, I don't have an issue with that. I just want to uh, redirect us back to the questioning, um, and then I'll go to Councilor Ruzzi for her questions, and then back to you for more questions, not reiterating the same point, hopefully. And then um, and then we can wrap up after that. Okay, Councilor Lujan, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you know, Councilor Baker, a trick could be just to say your statement and at the end ask a question by saying, what do you think, you know? But 
I'm not encouraging you to do that, I should say. Um, I have a question just about where in our budget you, are we addressing um, the black maternal health crisis um, and the disparities when it comes to birth giving. Um, I asked because I was looking at some of the data that EMS provided just in terms of like low birth weight and things of that nature. So mm -hmm. how are you addressing issues of um, black maternal health? So that's actually in our CAF Bureau, which I presented this morning, the Child, Adolescent, Family Health okay. Bureau. Yep. So um, we have the Healthy Baby, Healthy Child program, and I can give you the data that I mentioned this morning. Just okay. pull it back up Thank again. You. Um, we are working with the Massachusetts State Coalition that's focused in on black maternal health and advocating for legislation in that regard. And then I can just tell you how many women we work with, just so you know. Just let me go to it. I do apologize, um, Council Lujan. We do have to uh, um, close in about just five minutes. Yep, I just have one yeah. more question after this. So I'll just tell you, we provide in, the, in this last fiscal year, we provided services to more than 800 children, more than 385 pregnant women, and 522 postpartum women. Most of them are women of color, low income women of color. And that's providing services in their home. You know, we um, do a lot of work with them in terms of training and parenting and that sort of work with caregivers as well as as well as fathers. Um, so we're very much so involved in the advocacy in that regard and in programming. Okay. About how much do you, would you say monetarily is, is I dedicated would have to, go to this look issue? At the budget line. I don't know. Do we have that budget line item here? No. Okay. So we would have to get that back. We'd have to get back to okay. the exact line item. Thank you. Amount. And then my last Be question. Sorry. Before you finish, can I just excuse Dr. Msola? Oh. Thank yes. you. Yes. Oh, apologies. Um, uh, thank you. No, I, I made a commitment to, because I, I know that she's scheduled for something. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, Dr. Basola, I just wanted to say, um, I, did, I did allow that because we, all we are talking about creating platforms and talking non-conventional ways to make room and space for people to be able to advocate in the way that they do. Um, and that means, you know, from a counselor baker to, you know, the small single mom at home uh, coming in to testify. So. I did. I, I think that you can handle yourself, and you did that beautifully. And I just wanted to commend you, as a, from a black woman to a black woman, to be able to be the commissioner of uh, public health and be able to deal with all the intricacy and the nuances of a department that is highly uh, of whites and um, already systemically or traditionally or historically not necessarily where we want to be. But I commend you and I thank you for all of your service. And it's not easy to deal with what you deal with inside the department, outside the department, press releases, counselors. Um, but we are here to support you and uplift you and to continue to do this work together. I appreciate that. Thank you, Councilor Anderson. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Lujan. Oh, and Councilor Baker's gone. I was going to say thank you. <laughs> I was trying to hold on to him because I knew he was going to get up and leave, but that's okay. That's okay. Councilor Lujan, you have the floor. Thank you, and I echo everything uh, Councilor Vinanja Anderson said. My, my question is about youth rapid rehousing. Um, it says that, that there's a plan to rehouse youth within 90 days, which is an aggressive timeline, and I think that's really wonderful. I just wanted to know a little bit more detail about that program. Mm -hmm. So. We would need to get back to you with more details. Yeah, it's on one page 123 of our, our budget book. And then the last thing I'll say is that in the budget book, um, you know, it talks about the Homeless Service Bureau is not broken out by section programs for us to understand what's actually happening, mm -hmm. this breakdown of youth rapid rehousing. Like if that, you know, it's how, especially when there's significant funding, that breakdown would be helpful for us to understand, like, what does it programmatically look like and where are we putting our money? In, in homeless services. And homeless services, but that would also go to youth rapid rehousing too, right? Within 90 days, what does that, I mean, it's hard to rehouse someone in 90 days, you know, and I've, I've tried multiple times as an attorney and now as city councilor, so would like to know what that program looks like, because if there's, there's, if there's something that we're doing that's successful, I'd like to, I'd like to recreate it. And I'll, I'll find for you that line, that page with that information, just so that you're able Yeah, it's on page 123 of our budget book. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then just to answer your prior question about healthy baby, healthy child, that <coughs> funding is proposed this year for $4.2 million, which is an increase of 200000 from prior years. Okay, $4.2 million? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Can um, we have Maddie Lee? 
uh, to the mic and just in preparation for your testimony while uh, Council Lujan asks her questions. That's all. Those are my, I mean, so I, I'm really, that this will be a formal request via the chair for more detail on youth rapid rehousing, um, critical issue that we get a lot of questions about all the time. And it says the goal is to house homeless youth in market rate units in less than 90 days. If we're doing that, that's amazing. And I'd like to know more about it. Sure, understood. Hi, Maddie. Hello. Uh, welcome, state your name, affiliation, and residence if you choose. And you have, I'll give you three minutes to testify. Thank you. Um, thank you, city councilors, and thank you, AMS. Uh, my name is Maddie. I'm the senior engagement manager from the Phoenix. We're a sober active Maddie, community. can you start again and come closer to the mic, please? Yes. Can you hear me all right? Better. Okay. Thanks. My name is Maddie. Um, <clears throat> I'm the senior engagement manager for the Phoenix. We're a sober active community offering free fitness and social activities. The only requirement is 48 hours of sobriety. And I'm a Dorchester resident. Um, I have facts and figures that I've put together in a proposal, which the clerk, I think, has distributed to the counselors. So I won't go too heavy into that and instead want to, sh to share personally why I believe so strongly in the work that the Phoenix is doing. My mom is sober. My brother is sober, ironically, at the age of 21. And I share that just to say that I know what sobriety looks like. I didn't, however, know what a recovery community looks like until I started working in the field. My first experience working in a recovery community was my first job outside of college in Seattle when I moved across country to try something new. I was about three weeks into the job when I got a message from one of my best friends from college saying that her uh, boyfriend had died of using drugs. I immediately went outside, it was in the work day, to call her and was crying outside and called my colleague and said, I need to have someone bring out my bag, I need to go home and be alone. He came outside and uh, walked around with me and got me to open up about what had happened. And I shared the tragedy and explained that I just needed to go home and be alone. He paused and said to me, I don't know if you've caught on yet to what we're doing here, but when one of us is hurting, we don't let you be alone. It was at that moment that I really learned what a recovery community was. It's not just a place to sit and be sober. It's a healing environment where people build relationships and lean on each other for support and work through things together knowing that the trauma of substance use extends beyond the individual. I thought about that moment a lot during the pandemic since so many of us are suffering alone and turning to drugs and alcohol to cope. Overdoses have increased by 30% just from the year prior, as we've heard. That's why I feel fortunate that places like the Phoenix exist. They don't let people be alone. The Phoenix invites anyone with 48 hours of sobriety to come be a part of healing community. The Phoenix is for people who are new to recovery, in long-term recovery, friends, families, allies, supporters, anyone who wants to live a sober, healthier life. The Phoenix is for people who have lost confidence and self-esteem and need a place where they know that they'll find love and support to build them back up. The Phoenix is a place where you can try new things like rock climbing and push yourself, where you can begin identifying as a runner or a yogi rather than an addict or a grieving friend or someone with depression. The Phoenix is for the person who is recovering from an overdose on mass and cast, and it's also for the Boston EMS responder that saved them and has been tirelessly working to support the community during the pandemic. To, counselors, to Councillor Flynn's earlier question, uh, Boston EMS uses, uses Phoenix's gym daily for its health and wellness programming. Phoenix is for the returning citizen who just left incarceration and is unsure about themselves and their place in society and how to remain sober. And it's also for their probation officer who works out alongside them and gives them support during a workout and throughout their life. The Phoenix is for the daughter who burnt bridges with her parents when she stole from them in active addiction, but it's also for the mother who's learning to rebuild her relationship with her daughter in recovery. The Phoenix recognizes that addiction is not an individual problem, but it's a combination of traumatic life experiences, complex relationships, poverty, generational trauma, and so it takes a community approach in which all are welcome to normalize that healthy, sober community, to normalize what healthy, sober community looks like and to give each other support to live full, meaningful lives. At a recent Phoenix family night that we had, uh, one of our regular team members brought her grandson. I was moved thinking about the power that her recovery work will have on her family 
Not only is she breaking the intergenerational cycle of trauma by working on her own recovery, but her grandson is able to be a part of that recovery and witness firsthand and experience what resilience and health looks like. We're deeply invested in the Boston community. We partner with several city agencies like Boston EMS, Office of Returning Citizens, and nonprofit organizations so that we can have a collaborative approach and fill gaps for people who are in need. We serve as a hub for city partners to work together. We made a commitment to the city of Boston in 2017 when we bought a building in New Market Square. We're ready to be a permanent resource for the city, a center that builds community from people, for people all across the city, a space where people can try new things, find compassion, love, support. We currently have a $2.9 million loan on the building and that we own. We're asking for the city to invest in our permanent home by helping us pay off the loan so that we can lower operating costs going forward to make sure that all future dollars raised go directly to impacting the communities. We've also included a request for a capital improvement to the building, which will allow us to maximize space so that we can have multiple classes going on at once. Our fi finally, we also request $300,000 of general operating support for three years so that we can remain a consistent resource and support our work as we rise to the challenges posed by the pandemic. Today, we're submitting a proposal for $5 million, and we respectfully request that you consider this as it will be a tremendous improvement as we aim to reach thousands more people in recovery and those who love them and support them, all with free, accessible healing, recovery, support, and community. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Maddie. Maddie, did you say you're 21? No, my younger brother. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, my son's 23. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Maddie, I'm very, I'm so impressed with your work. Um, and thank you so much for taking the time and being patient and waiting for your turn. Um, really appreciate the work that you guys do at the Phoenix. And um, yeah, just completely impressed with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate the time. Um, so I don't, I don't have any... Um, other questions. I think we can wrap it up here. Do you have any closing statements? I wanted to um, address uh, the EMS. I didn't uh, really have a back and forth with you guys, but um, Chief Hooley, I really appreciate you. We've only had maybe one or two encounters ever, um, and you just strike me to be uh, just a really decent human being, and I appreciate the work that you do. I appreciate the EMS. Um, everyone in your department. Um, and I really, really appreciate that you understand that we should move toward equitable, equitable pay and hire, hiring of uh, people of color in your department. I really appreciate that you understand that um, and that you so eloquently explained today that we have begun to do a better job um, and be more intentional in outreach and how we are paying for trainings really want to work with your department and seeing how we can increase the funding to pay for those trainings and uh, certifications for uh, especially recruits of color. Um, and we'll definitely be in touch. We're very interested in this. We've been talking to different organizations and people that are interested in supporting you as well. Um, if you have any comments, I'll allow you the floor to do that now. And if not, we'll adjourn. Uh, well, thank you very much for those very gracious words. Uh, no, I mean, we're, we're doing this because it's the right thing. You know, we, we realize that, and as an agency, we uh, Boston EMS has always tried to, in the, in the field of EMS, we've always tried to lead the way, but we've always thought of it, and we have certainly focused on technical training and a lot of things, but but we also we want to incorporate all of this into it and it, is, it isn't one or the other it's it, it has to be if we're going to serve everybody in the city going forward and i think you know you're starting to see that in the makeup of the recruit classes but we have to go even well beyond that on um uh the only thing that i would add is i i realize uh counselor i didn't come near to answering your question when i started going down about a few different things, so I will. But we we do have uh, several programs that we've done, and are continuing to do in BPS, and have uh, made different attempts for other outreach and uh, things that we've done at uh, 
specialty schools, kids at risk, a few other ones, but, but also things to try to improve cardiac arrest survival across the city by getting uh, CPR anytime taught everywhere. Uh, stuff. We'll, 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 de we'll detail that all out in writing, return it to you, Madam Chair. As same as any other question that we owe you information on, we'll, we'll get you the specifics on that. Thank you so much. I think the equity packet that we sent was sort of combined all in BPHC, and we would like to see uh, the demographics in your agency. I saw the, the chart, but I didn't actually outline the numbers and in the way that we asked. Um, if you contract out, if there's any procurements, we would like to see the demographics and locations of those as well. We will be calling you back for, as a chair of Ways and Means, I'll be calling you back for equity hearing in the budget that we've, that I filed a couple of months ago. Um, in that, we're looking to sort of compile and aggregate data on equity and just being really intentional about uh, measuring how we are working on equity in the city of Boston and leading by example, as I'm sure we all want to do that. It's a difficult thing because sometimes this conversation can pose or some people may feel uncomfortable and as though it poses a threat to their livelihood or their self-preservation. Um, but I think that there's hope. I think that there's space for everyone to be able to work good middle class, work in jobs or, or higher, um, to be able to continue to provide for their family and for all of us to continue to grow as a society, as one community. I thank you for your work and I look forward to uh, working with you. Thank you. Meeting thank adjourned. you. I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you.